Okay, good afternoon and welcome to today's uh, joint hearing on the implementation of UPK and 3K expansion and the transition of Early Learn uh, NYC to the Department of Education. Um, I want to thank uh, Chair um, Levin uh, for co-chairing this hearing with us today and, and I know that he is, he is on his way. Uh, the Education Committee uh, is also hearing resolution number uh, 358, sponsored by Council Member uh, Lori Cumbo, calling upon the city to eliminate the disparity in compensation paid to teachers, staff, and directors at community-based early learn New York City centers as compared to the compensation paid uh, to Department of Education instructors for similar employment. Uh, thank you uh, to the members who are here with us today. Uh, before uh, we begin, I, I want to note uh, DOE announced some major restructuring and staffing changes this morning, and I'm very interested to learn more about the department's plans and intentions as far as those changes are concerned. Uh, we have a lot to discuss today, but I hope to learn more about that very soon. And I just want to note for the record that the council, this committee, both committees and staff worked around the schedule of the DOE to get this day and time. So I am disappointed that I, I, I'm learning uh, this morning that the Deputy Chancellor has to head over to a press conference at 4 p.m. Uh, but it's my understanding that the Deputy Chancellor will return after, the, after that uh, press conference. But again, I just want the record to reflect that this committee uh, accommodated the DOE to the extent that we could uh, around their schedule. And we appreciate that moving forward that we all keep to those commitments uh, to advance our critical work. Um, the benefits of early childhood education are well established. We've seen studies that show that by five years old, the children uh, of lower income uh, parents may enter school so far behind their peers that they may never be able to catch up. And we have seen studies which show that providing the earliest supports possible for kids in turn helps parents and provides better outcomes for all, including long-term positive effects on economic measures and social behavioral development. I commend the administration on the good work uh, that has been done implementing pre-K for all and now 3K for all programs. And I look forward to hearing more today about how the city is effectively working to ease the burdens on families of early childhood care and helping children thrive in this critical moment of development. I am encouraged that this administration is working to further support all early childhood services by moving Early Learn NYC from ACS to DOE. Until now, uh, low-income parents enrolled in Head Start, Pre-K, or home-based uh, daycare, for example, have had to navigate four different city agencies for childcare. If we proceed thoughtfully, consolidating programs under DOE could simplify this process and create amazing benefits for families and young children. So we find ourselves with a major opportunity to build on uh, and learn from past mistakes and provide a strong, successful system to our youngest, most vulnerable New Yorkers and their families. I look forward to hearing from DOE today on, on the plans that are underway to ensure the transition will be as smooth as possible. In particular, I look forward to hearing how DOE is working with ACS to manage this new uh, diverse range of programs that DOE has not previously overseen as the department's portfolio expands to children as young as zero to three years old. I'm interested to hear details relating to DOE's management of these contracts and whether they will release a concept paper in advance of issuing a new RFP. I understand that ACS is continuing to oversee the voucher programs that help families afford childcare, and so I hope to hear about the plans for interagency coordination and keeping the process as simple as possible for, for families uh, going forward. I'm also interest, very interested in, uh, to hear about how DOE plans to address the discrepancies in pay between educators in city-run and privately-run uh, centers. The city needs salary, salary parity. This is a chief concern that will now fall to DOE to resolve. As I stated earlier, the Education Committee is hearing Resolution 358 today on this issue. 
The salaries for certified early childhood teachers at CBOs need to be the same as at DOE. It's that simple. And I just want to note that because we don't have parity, um, I keep hearing about the vacancies that exists in um, these centers. And we're dealing with a, uh, a young population uh, going through the formative years of their lives that are looking to build relationships. And that's a big part of learning at that age, social, socialization skills and building relationships. How do you do that when the adult in the room keeps changing or, or leaves because of economic reasons? And then there's difficulty recruiting and keeping and retaining that educator in that classroom. Um, and their, their requirements are the same for any DOE-based teacher. So it's as simple as saying equal pay for equal work, equal pay for the equal amount of qualifications necessary to be an educator. So I want to thank Majority Leader Cumbo for her resolution and for her leadership on this issue. Though the implementation and expansion of UPK and 3K programs and the evolution of Early Learn NYC have not been without issue, the consolidation of these systems creates an opportunity to build a strong structure for an equitable and sustainable early child care landscape. I hope we can have a productive conversation today about the opportunities to make all these programs better and make thoughtful investments in our city's children and families. I'd like to thank our committee counsel, Beth Golub, Policy Analyst Jan Atwell, Kalima Johnson, Finance Analyst Caitlin O'Hagan, Elizabeth Hoffman, and Community Engagement Liaison uh, Millie Bonilla. I'd like to also thank uh, my staff, Hannah Scaife, Vanessa Ogle, and uh, Eric Feinberg. I um, just want to acknowledge the members th th that are here, uh, Council Member Brennan, uh, Council Member Barron, uh, Council Member Levine, Council Member Ulrich, Council Member Lander, Council Member Cohen, Council Member Grudenchik, Council Member Adams. Uh, if I missed anyone, I apologize. Uh, but with that, we'll now hear from uh, the. Uh, I'd like to just uh, swear folks in if, if that's okay. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today, and to answer honestly the council member questions? You may begin. Uh, good afternoon, um, Chair Chairperson Traeger and members of the General Welfare and Education Committees here today. My name is Laura Ayatali Vargas, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Child and Family Wellbeing at the Administration for Children's Services. I'm joined by Josh Wallach, Deputy Chancellor for Early Childhood Education and Student Enrollment at the Department of Education. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss our work to support New York City's youngest children and their families. This is an exciting moment to further strengthen and align the early care and education system and set the next generation of New Yorkers on the path to success. New York City has made major investments in high quality, free and affordable early care and education programs over the last decade, including Early Learn at ACS and Pre-K for All and 3K for All at DOE. With the essential partnership of community-based organizations, including Head Start, child care agencies, and family child care providers, these initiatives represent the city's deep commitment to early childhood and to supporting the needs of children and families at a critical moment in development. The City Council has been a crucial advocate for and supporter of these programs, and together we have been able to give hundreds of thousands of children a strong start in school and in life. Building on these historic investments, in, 20, in April 2017, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced the transition of Early Learn from ACS to DOE to create a stronger and more unified birth to five early care and education system in New York City. In September 2017, ACS Commissioner David Hansel expanded the ACS Division of Early Care and Education to create the Division of Child and Family Well-Being, CFWB, a new ACS division focused solely on primary prevention, 
of abuse and neglect. CFWB aims to engage families in the community before they ever reach the child welfare system with resources and services to help them thrive. This new division focuses on the factors that contribute to family well-being, including quality education, health care, housing, culture, and employment, and uses place-based and population-based approaches to engage families and communities. This is part of an ongoing effort to disrupt disparity, establish access resources for at-risk families, and promote opportunities for children to reach their full potential. To do this, CFWB is working collaboratively with other city agencies, including the Department of Education, as well as the Children's Cabinet, ACS provider and community partners, and community advocates. Our new division is built on the strengths of our continuing work in the early care and education system. Over the past several years, we've been able to infuse a high level of quality into our early learn contracted system. We developed and implemented monitoring protocols that allow for uniform support and oversight of all early learn programs. And we provide targeted technical assistance and regular training for our programs. Due to these efforts, ACS passed three audits two announced and one unannounced by the Federal Office of Head Start between 2015 and 2016, each one with no findings and no corrective action required. This is a major milestone in, and is the, first time in New York, is the first time New York City has had such positive results. We are proud to transition the early learn system at this high point. In addition to investing in the quality of the system, we have also made investments in innovative programs that use a two-generation lens, wrapping services and supports for social-emotional learning and economic supports around the entire family. One accomplishment we'd like to highlight is the implementation of TraumaSmart. In partnership with Thrive NYC, TraumaSmart is designed to address the wide range of experiences impacting our children and families by using our childcare programs as hubs of trauma-informed care in our communities. As of this month, over 14,000 providers have been intensively trained in this model. When we consider the thousands of children and families who are touched by these providers, we can appreciate the incredible depth and reach of this innovative program. We are pursuing other innovative initiatives as well. Beginning in 2016, ACS partnered with CUNY's Professional Development Institute to fund education for the parents of Head Start students to become accredited teachers for infants and toddlers. We know that economic supports are critical for our low-income families, and this program supports and encourages parents to pursue their Child Development Associates degree, or a CDA, by creating a critical, but it also creates a critical professional pipeline for infant and toddler classrooms across the city. By supporting the educational advancement of our parents, we are supporting the economic mobility of their families. Graduates of the CDA program are now employed at early learn centers, and many continue to pursue further education. In fact, two weeks ago, we graduated our fourth cohort of parents from this successful program. I am pleased to share with you a small sample of how ACS has strengthened our early learn system during the course of this administration. We strongly believe these changes to the early education system and the creation of this new division at ACS will benefit children, families, educators, program staff, and New York City as a whole. And we look forward to detailing these benefits in today's testimony. At this point, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Deputy Chancellor Josh Wallach. Thank you for having us here today. Uh, good afternoon, Chairs Traeger and Levin, um, and all the council members here today. Uh, I am Josh Wallach, uh, Deputy Chancellor for Early Childhood Education and Student Enrollment at the Department of Education. I'm very pleased here, uh, to be here today to discuss our work to ensure that all New York City children have access to high quality early childhood care and education. I want to say I'm, I apologize for the last minute schedule change and appreciate your understanding. Um, when I do have to leave um, uh, briefly, the Chief of Staff for the Division, Emmy Liss, will be here and can continue to answer questions until I return and then I'll be back as soon as I possibly can to continue. 
As you know, the city's investments in early care and education recognize that high quality programs improve children's performance throughout their school experience. These investments have been made through several initiatives. Um, the Early Learn System of Contracted Early Care and Education launched in 2012 at ACS serves over 30,000 children from six weeks to five years old in center-based and home-based settings. And Early Learn is funded by the Federal Head Start Grant, State Child Care Development Block Grant, and city tax, uh, city tax dollars. As Lorelei detailed, these programs have had a strong positive impact for low-income children and their families. In 2014, New York City launched the Pre-K for All initiative at the Department of Education. Within four years, the number of four-year-olds receiving free, full-day, high-quality pre-K increased from 19,000 to nearly 70,000 today, including uh, the 10,000 children served in the Early Learn system. We utilize a mixed delivery model to offer our programs in both district schools and community-based organizations, and we support program quality with on-site support from approximately 146 instructional coordinators, experienced early childhood educators that coach on site, and 140 social workers. In 2017, the city began expanding its early education offerings to provide two years of free full day high quality preschool through 3K for all. After launching in community school districts seven and 23 in 2017, 3K for All will expand this fall to serve approximately 5,000 three-year-olds in school districts 4, 5, 7, 16, 23, and 27. The programs will expand to school districts 6, 9, 19, and 31 in 2019, and school districts 12 and 29 in 2020. Every district will take two years to get to universal access for every three-year-old whose family wants a seat. And with our planned expansion, we will serve over 19,000 three-year-olds across all five boroughs. Our aim is to take 3K for All citywide in 2021 with support from our partners in state and federal government. In July 2019, the Early Learn System will transfer from the Administration for Children's Services to the Department of Education. The goal of the transition of Early Learn to the DOE is to unify and further strengthen the early care and education system in New York City. We want to make New York City an even more supportive place for families raising young children and for more children to have access to high quality early care and education. Creating a more unified birth to five system will benefit children, families, and early education providers as children will have more seamless supports through their early care and education experience starting at birth. This includes seamless connections and greater curricular alignment between early childhood programs and K through 12 education. Families will have access to a range of programs to meet the varied needs of their children age zero to five and expanded access to information about their choices. Providers will have a better aligned set of supports and consistent quality standards for their programs. Access to integrated data, a single contracting relationship for age zero to five services and less administrative burden. As part of the early learn transition, the Department of Education will apply to be New York City's Head Start grantee through the Federal Office of Head Start's free and open grant competition this fall. The DOE's management of New York City's Head Start and early Head Start programs is dependent upon our, uh, on our successful application and award. The funding and services that come from the Head Start grant are critical for ensuring the city is able to best meet, meet the needs of the most vulnerable children and families. We will be in touch with you about how you can support those efforts over the next several weeks. The July 2019 Early Learn contract transfer timeline aligns with the Head Start grant competition timeline. The Office of Head Start announced earlier this year that grants will be awarded to begin in July 2019. Current Early Learn contracts will be extended through June 2020 to ensure there is no disruption to services for children and families during this time of transition. The DOE will run a procurement for new contracts to start in summer or fall of 2020. The contracts awarded through this procurement will replace all the current contracts the city holds with providers of early care and education, including current pre-K, 3K, and early learn contracts. DOE has been conducting extensive outreach to hear about early childhood providers' experiences under the current system. And we know that while providers will not experience significant change at the time of the initial transfer, the creation of a more unified birth to five system 
will represent a real programmatic and contractual change. And toward this end, we will run an extensive outreach effort to ensure that providers are fully informed about the RFP process and the timeline for new contracts that will begin in 2020. We will hold briefings for your offices and with other partners like the Daycare Council and DC 1707. We will make this process as simple and accessible as possible and will seek your partnership to ensure all providers in your districts know when and how to apply. The transition of early learn to the DOE presents an especially meaningful opportunity to integrate services for children with developmental del delays and disabilities in early childhood. Research shows that interventions and inclusive learning opportunities can build the foundation for educational success if they're provided at this age. The DOE is committed to collaborating closely with our partners to identify solutions to longstanding challenges. We've been collaborating with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to better support families as they transition out of early intervention systems to the Department of Education. We are also working closely with our Office of Special Education to improve services for children with disabilities who are three or four years old. We are working to improve early childhood data systems, align policies, expand program offerings, and provide quality services for children regardless of which program serves them. We are also focused on supporting staff recruitment and retention at our many community-based organizations, more of whom will be contracting with the DOE following this transition. We greatly value our early education teachers and the important work they do. And the DOE is committed to helping all providers recruit and retain a talented workforce and grow that workforce over time. We will continue to offer our community-based partners access to lead teacher retention incentives and support in certified teacher recruitment and hiring. Over the past year, staff at ACS and the Department of Education have engaged in a productive process of close coordination and collaboration to prepare for the transfer of early learn contracts. In the spring and summer of 2017, we launched interagency working groups to promote cross-agency learning and collaboration and began monthly joint meetings between agency staff. We've engaged key stakeholders across the city to solicit guidance, feedback, and ideas on the creation of a Birth to Five system. Starting in the fall of 2017, this has included direct engagement with early learn providers through more than 60 one-on-one -on -one meetings with program leaders, as well as an ongoing series of approximately 30 roundtable meetings. We convened two key advisory groups comprised of advocates, researchers, policy experts, early childhood education providers, and others to weigh in on our ongoing program design process including as that process relates to home-based providers and infant and toddler care. We've met with parent groups, family groups, to provide updates and find opportunities for collaboration and held focus groups with the families of three-year-olds. Current ACS staff who support early learn programs will transition to the Department of Education um, when, uh, as the contracts do in July of 2019. We are working closely with the Office of Labor Relations and the unions who represent these staff to ensure a smooth transfer. Our department is excited to welcome our incoming colleagues and work to leverage our combined expertise, resources, and field presence to offer broad technical assistance and supports for all providers to foster high quality, developmentally appropriate care for families choosing home or center-based care for children birth through five. In collaboration with ACS, we have been providing support to early learn programs through instructional coaching, visits from social workers, and professional learning. Our outreach team has been supporting early learn programs across the city through enrollment trainings and direct connections to interested families, and is able to leverage the investments made in family outreach and engagement for the expansion of pre-K for all and 3K for all. In addition, our Office of Teacher Recruitment and Quality works collaboratively with institutions of higher education to support all pre-K and 3K providers in finding high quality teachers for their classrooms, including at early learn programs. They host recruitment events throughout the year and serve as a resource to both potential teachers and providers. As part of this transition, we plan to extend support to family child care networks in the city building on a recent pilot program by the Administration for Children's Services in partnership with an organization called All Our Kin. This support includes on-site coaching, professional learning, and business workshops for participating providers. Our city's ambitious goals for children's earliest years also include ensuring that all children are reading on grade level by the end of second grade. 
to align our investments in young children even further and create a continuum from birth to age eight, the uh, administration's universal literacy initiative has become part of the Division of Early Childhood Education at the Department of Education. This initiative has built a team of uh, over 200 coaches who work with teachers in kindergarten through second grade to advance their early literacy skills. And this fall, the workforce will grow to over 400 coaches uh, as we fulfill the mayor and chancellor's pledge to support every elementary school in the city. Over time, we will work towards greater alignment between all of those early learning programs from birth through the universal literacy program in second grade. Thank you for being passionate advocates for early childhood education. We are proud to expand access and improve the quality of the city's early care and education programs through the creation of this more unified birth to five system. And we're grateful for your continued support we look forward to your ongoing partnership. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, um, uh, both uh, Deputy Commissioner Vargas and Deputy Chancellor Wallach. Um, uh, I want to apologize for my being late. I had another hearing off-site, so I want to uh, thank my co-chair for getting the hearing started and you for your testimony, which I've been able to uh, read over during while you're reading it. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, members who have arrived as well, uh, Councilmember Cornegy, uh, Councilmember Amphrey Samuels. Um, is anyone else that wasn't acknowledged? Councilmember Rose. Um, uh, and uh, those that are on both committees get double credit for being here. Um, so uh, I, I want to uh, just to say a couple of opening words, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, my co-chair, for, for his questions. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, as has been said, ACS currently administers the largest municipal child care system in the nation, Early Learn NYC. Early Learn is an early education model that merges subsidized child care, has certain universal pre-K into a single system for delivering education services to children six weeks to four years old. In a city where child care is one of the greatest expenses for low-income families with children, the Early Learn NYC program provides affordable to no-cost care for eligible families five days a week, up to 10 hours a day. Early Learn was launched in October 2012 and has been administered by ACS, ACS since then. The program was developed with the ambitious goal of improving quality standards, enhancing professional development, and providing full day, day, uh, full day care. However, Early Learn has faced challenges since its inception. Many providers struggled to achieve full enrollment. Some providers that were awarded contracts had to withdraw seats due to difficulties in implementation. The decreased overall capacity by this increase, decreased overall capacity by thousands of slots. The ratio of enrollment to capacity in the contracted care system continues to be lower than it was in the year prior to Early Learn uh, being launched. Um, today, our hearing is going to be focusing on the shift from ACS to DOE, but we're all gonna, also going to highlight um, the, the gap in pay and work hours between programs provided in public schools versus programs in community-based organizations. Teachers are doing the same job, but getting paid different salaries. At the CBO's, recruitment and retention of staff is a growing challenge. This challenge may be further compounded by the as the administration rolls out 3K for all, which could intensify competition for teachers. And just a, a, a note about that. Um, we cannot, in good conscience, continue to have a two-tiered system for paying compensation and benefits within our early childhood education system. It is, um, it is to the great detriment of the overall system to have these uh, two tracks. It has been uh, incredibly difficult for community-based organizations to be able to maintain both their enrollment but also their ability to recruit um, qualified teachers. And, um, and it's, a, it's a both a moral obligation but it's also in the city's interest uh, as we're looking at um, uh, moving this system over the Department of Education to be able to have a long-term vision and goal that, that is going to have to require uh, adequate and um, equivalent pay across the system. We cannot, absolutely not any further, have a two-tiered system, which is what we have today. So we're going to continue to insist on that, and I'm going to ask questions about that during this hearing. Um, I think we would all agree that our end goal is achieving a quality early childhood education system. 
however, it's uh, it's not clear exactly how we're going to be achieving that goal. And so I hope that this hearing will afford us a chance to in, uh, inform the process leading up to July 2019 when the contracts will move over from ACS to DOE. This would include issuing a concept paper, and I know that that's not standard for the Department of Education, but that is what happened uh, when in 2010 when, when, uh, when ACS initially rolled out uh, early learn. And so I think a concept paper is absolutely essential uh, beyond having community engagement sessions. I think a, an official concept paper that has a, a formal um, uh, process to, um, to inform this RFP uh, from providers and from the uh, uh, from the overall child care system um, that people that are working in that system organizations and um, uh, and uh, advocacy organizations as well I think is is uh, is essential uh, I know it's not standard but um, but uh, moving a, a large system like this over from one agency to the other is also not standard so we should be uh, we should be taking that uh, this opportunity to do that um, and uh, that was it was it was useful in the past. It will be useful in the future. Um, I also want to uh, just acknowledge uh, Deputy Commissioner Vargas's um, efforts in, um, in in really making great strides with um, with the Head Start system here in New York City. When she took over as Deputy Commissioner, um, they were facing major challenges from uh, the federal government, and um, uh, she took on that that issue with. Uh, a, a lot of professionalism and responsibility, and uh, from from uh, what we're being re reported, um, what we're hearing reported, uh, it's it's been uh, largely successful. So I want to just acknowledge the effort that you've done in your team uh, at making that a success. Uh, before we w before we get back to uh, uh, my co-chair's questions, I want to thank committee staff who helped put this to together today, uh, Councilman De Kelawan, Policy Analyst Tanya Cyrus and Crystal Pond, Finance Analyst Daniel Krupp, and Finance Unit Head Doheny Sampura. I'd also like to thank my staff, uh, the, the Education Committee staff for their work, as well as my Chief of Staff, Jonathan Boucher, Policy Director Edward Paulino, and Legislative Director Elizabeth Adams. And I'll turn it back over to my co-chair, Mark Traeger. Thank you so much, uh, Chair uh, Levin, for, for your leadership uh, on this issue. Uh, way before this hearing, and uh, we look forward to our partnership together. Uh, also just want to note that we've also been joined by <coughs> Councilor uh, Jonai. So I, I appreciate the remarks uh, we've heard from the Deputy Commission, the Deputy Chancellor. Uh, certainly the remarks were filled with some of the positive highlights of, of the transition. What I didn't hear I is how we're addressing the challenges that are also traveling uh, along with this transition to the DOE. Um, we are here to address and solve problems. Um, and, uh, and so I just want to get right to it. I, I didn't hear anything about addressing uh, the parity issue. Um, I, and so I just want to, one of the most significant challenges uh, to the city's early childhood education programs is the wage disparities between teachers and community-based organizations and Department of Education schools. Uh, what is the Department of Education doing uh, to address this issue? Appreciate the question very much. Um, so um, uh, we understand that this is uh, an important issue um, um, that we've been hearing about um, from providers as we go around the city. Um, learning about the best ways we can make this transition successful. Um, and we believe uh, we want to help all of our providers recruit and retain the very best talent to teach our youngest children. That's why the administration has made some steps um, since the launch of Pre-K for All to address this issue. First, by adding money into the budget, about $16 million when we initially started Pre-K for All to raise the salaries of some educators in our community-based organizations. And then the city was part of the discussions between the Daycare Council and Local 1707. That resulted in a new contract with increased salaries and better access to health care for our early childhood educators. So we have made some strides on this issue. That being said, um, we hear uh, from providers and from advocates and others that there's still more to do. And so as we are discussing the transition, we're listening and learning about the um, dimensions of that issue. Uh, at the same time, we're very aware that um, 
if and when there is a resolution to that issue, it will be worked out at the bargaining table between the daycare council, which represents the management of those organizations, and 1707, which represents the workers. Of course, the city is a, a part of that conversation, but ultimately the solution will be worked out uh, as part of the collective bargaining process. So I just want to just ask some further clarification uh, questions. Um, are the requirements to be a DOE teacher, uh, as far as, I'm sorry, the requirements to be a CBO head teacher are the same for a DOE teacher? Um, the answer is that, um, first of all, everybody who's at the head of a classroom as part of the early care and education system is a qualified, excellent teacher. We believe in that. Uh, legally, the requirements are slightly different. Um, uh, teachers in Department of Education classrooms are all certified. In, in community-based organizations, um, some are certified, some are on their way to being certified and in a part of a study plan to become certified over time. Uh, that being said, again, all of them are qualified, excellent at their jobs, and both agencies do a lot of work to support those teachers and help them continue to develop professionally so that they're at their very best in front of the classrooms for our kids. Right. But to be clear, the, the head teacher and the CBO is, is, also, is fully certified. Is certified or on their way to being certified, that's right. And same thing with DOE teachers. They're, they are and on they're their way to get a master's degree as well. Uh, Some of them. Th there's a way to get permanent certification, which I had to go through, which I am very much aware of. So they have to go through the same rigorous process. And what is the starting salary for a DOE teacher? Um, I don't know the exact, because it's changed over time, um, um, so I'll have to get back to you with the exact figure. Deputy Chancellor, you are a Deputy Chancellor. Yes. And, and that is a question that, quite frankly, should be answered here. Yes, I just don't have it in front of me. I, I know that what we did in the, um, in the negotiations, what we did um, in and what occurred in the last round of negotiations between the Daycare Council and uh, 1707 is that the start we th they came to an agreement that the starting salaries for lead teachers in community-based organizations would increase to $44,000 for a teacher with a bachelor's and $50,000 for a teacher with a master's um, in 2020. And those starting salaries were um, roughly in line with the starting salaries for DOE teachers represented by the United Federation for Teachers at the time that agreement was met. That's the, those are the numbers I know well because that's the way we thought about um, uh, how to get that in line, um, and those those salaries were in line. Since then, I know there have been some adjustments, and I'll have to get back to you with the, with the exact figures. I would just say that a big part and big driving force behind this hearing is this issue of parity and how it has a profound, imp a significant impact on the ability of providers to attract, retain uh, educators uh, because of the disparity issue where folks go to the DOE system. So in, in order for us to have an honest conversation, we should know what the salaries are. Um, and, and so, uh, do you have the figure for the, the starting salary for a CBO teacher? Uh, what I just mentioned, the forty-four and 50000 is what was agreed to. And I'll just, I want to add, um, if I might, that um, as we're looking at this issue, though I understand it's important and I don't, this is not meant to minimize, but just to add to it, in an additional effort to address the issue you're pointing to, we also, at the Department of Education, um, made available um, a set of signing and retention incentives um, to help increase the compensation of the qualified educators in our community-based organizations and also provide a sort of rich array of professional learning supports to those teachers. And I think, again, the bottom line for us is we know that we could not succeed in rolling out pre-K for all, 3K for all, or any of the other ambitious programs that we want to have for our youngest children without the hard work um, and dedication of the workforce all across the system. Um, and so we've made a number of efforts to try to increase the compensation, but also the opportunities for professional development 
for our educators across the system, and that commitment will continue. Um, I, we understand that this is an ongoing issue and concern, and as we go around the city, we're learning more about it and listening, um, but we're making those efforts and have uh, made those steps in the direction. Deputy Chancellor, I, I just have to, I cannot, first of all, we should have figures and numbers here to work with, but I also just want, want to stress, if, if we are promising people a quality education, we need to make sure that we attract, retain quality folks who have gone through all the licensing requirements and the training, and, and, and the best way to, to keep them and to attract them is to pay them equal to what the DOE pays uh, their, their starting teachers, which is higher than uh, what CBOs are cur currently required to pay. Um, when the DOE issues the new RFP, will you be reopening the collective bargaining agreements uh, with CBOs? The, um, the contract uh, that currently is in place um, operates through 2020. Um, and the schedule for collective bargaining and the schedules for procurements are, are different things. Does, is there anything that legally prohibits the administration from engaging um, in good faith collective bargaining before 2020? Um, uh, at this, I mean, as I said, we are, um, we are, as we go around the city planning for this transition, we're having a lot of conversations and understanding this issue. Um, but at the moment, uh, but the, this contract lasts through 2020. Um, and we are anticipating a procurement um, that um, has services beginning in 2020. So those are the timelines we're operating under at the moment. Uh, all right, again, just to reiterate, my question was, is, is there anything that legally prohibits the DOE from the administration from engaging in good faith collective bargaining prior to 2020? I, I'm not trying to, uh, uh, I'm just saying I'm not, I'm not a lawyer and don't know what, what is prohibited legally or not, but at the moment, um, there's no plans to engage in collective bargaining ahead of that timeline. I think so in general, I mean, but, I, but so, so just to, sorry, go ahead. Deputy Chancellor, then you, then you are contradicting your earlier statement because you had mentioned before that you want to, that this issue should be resolved through collective bargaining. We want to address these issues now. Um, we're seeing a transition next year. Um, I believe, and, and your testimony talked about the benefits and the highlights of that transition, but nowhere in these five pages, six pages, did I hear anything about addressing the pressing existing challenges. And we're going to hear from a lot of providers, a lot of folks who are on the ground and impacted communities about their inability to attract and retain uh, educators because of this disparity issue. And I want to thank uh, Beth Golub, my uh, committee counsel here, the, the starting, uh, according to the DOE's own website, Deputy yeah. Chancellor, uh, I'm sorry, and to the UFT, uh, the starting teacher salary with a bachelor's degree uh, for the DOE teacher is $56,711. And I think I heard you before mention for that for the CBO, it's 44000 with, with a bachelor's. That's the agreement that was struck between the daycare council and 1707. Correct. So just, just, just for the record, for, for my colleagues and the public to hear, the starting DOE teacher with a bachelor is $56,711, and a starting teacher salary, again, same requirements uh, for a CBO, $44,000. That is a major issue. That is a major part of this problem because the folks who have gone through all the schooling and the licensing and building up their credentials, they're moving to the DOE system. Understandably so, because they have families of their own to take care of, bills to pay, student loans to pay back. And that's why CBOs are having a very, very difficult time uh, making uh, ends meet. And again, I don't think I've heard you know, an answer to the question, maybe it's intentional, that there's nothing that legally prohibits the administration from entering in good faith collective bargaining prior to 2020. And I'm urging the administration, and check with, check with lawyers, <laughs> but I think nothing prohibits you from engaging uh, uh, with folks in good faith collective bargaining and resolve the disparity issue once and for all. Uh, what efforts are being made to address the high teacher turnover rate? And do you have any data with you about uh, the number of vacancies and the, the retention rates uh, in CBOs? 
Um, I don't have that. I don't have information um, with me here about that. Um, I will say that um, we work very closely with our program leaders, with um, our colleagues at the Administration for Children's Services. What we do is work on a constant basis with community-based organizations using the same human resources tools that are used for district school teachers. So our, our Office of Human Resources goes out and recruits um, the finest candidates, uh, finest early educators we can find, um, and then helps them connect both with district schools and with community-based organizations through hiring fairs and by sending resume books, et cetera, um, and helps them make those, those connections. And we keep in touch with the CBOs to make sure that they're fully staffed and work with them until, we, until they tell us that they are. And then at the same time, as I mentioned, we um, make signing and retention bonuses available, both to help them attract those teachers and to help them retain them over time, along with the professional learning efforts that we, we uh, provide. Uh, Deputy Commissioner, do you have any data with you uh, since, the, I mean, about the number of vacancies that exist and the retention rates? I don't have the data. I don't have the data on me, but I'm sure if we, you know, we can connect after this, and we could pull that data for you. Right, but but this but this speaks to the oversight of, of the program because, how, <laughs> I mean, these are the, the, some of the biggest pressing challenges with the program. Uh, this is not a new issue. This has been ongoing, um, and so I'm very disappointed that folks came here unprepared. Um, and I, I don't think that's a coincidence. I also don't think it's a coincidence that folks have to leave uh, early, early here as well. Uh, this is a very serious issue. Um, now, I have a couple more, and then I want to turn to my colleagues. I, I want to be mindful of their time as well. Um, can you describe the staff at DOE whose responsibilities will include early childhood education? Uh, how many people will have oversight uh, over this program area, and what will their level of expertise look like? Sure. Um, I think one of the one of the tremendous opportunities of this transition is to bring together uh, two incredible teams that have a great deal of expertise in early childhood education. So the staff that has been at the Administration for Children's Services, I'll say a, a couple of sentences and then um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Lorelai after I finish describing DOE, but we're excited because you know, as we discussed, they're a team that has moved the city, you know, miles in, particularly in managing Head Start, but also in managing a set of incredibly complicated um, and successful programs for children birth to five. They'll be coming over to, to join um, a team that has also accomplished a great deal in launching Pre-K for All and 3K for All. So I'll say, broadly speaking, what we have is a mix of, um, of, of early childhood educators that have worked in a mix of district schools. Some have worked in district schools. Some have worked in community-based organizations, including Head Start and Early Head Start and Child Care. And both teams have that range of experience. Um, both teams have an, a range of experience in working with children from birth uh, through five and even older than that. Um, and, um, and social workers, um, on, again, from both teams. Um, I at the Department of Education. Um, they have a growing expertise in early childhood mental health and in partnering with families to help engage them as partners in early learning. Um, and as um, Deputy Commissioner Vargas mentioned, um, the social workers there have been implementing um, a, um, a Thrive program, which she'll describe. So all in all, an incredibly rich um, set of backgrounds um, that will come together to be able to support early care and education programs that really address um, child development in a holistic way. So not only building early cognitive skills, but also social emotional skills and in empower families to work with us as the primary partners in their children's education um, and as families that will have real voice in the early care and education system and in our public school system. We also have, and, I'll, and then I'll stop, um, an, uh, a, a team of people who um, help with business operations um, for child care and Head Start providers, um, and uh, uh, an incredible team of outreach workers who help fan out to communities across the city, inform them about the benefits of early care and education, and help them navigate the enrollment process. And there's others as well, but that's, those are just some of the teams that I think will come together as part of this transition. Anything to add? 
I, I would only add to that that, you know, ACS is also with our staff where, you know, we have staff as well that, you know, run the gamut in terms of BA, MA, you know, masters in social work. Even we have even a couple of lawyers um, on the team who have worked in the early childhood space. And they're bringing uh, to DOE not only deep competency and experience in the early childhood space, um, but also deep relationships with the providers that they've built over the years. I just want to make clear on this point is that that as we're shifting from ACS to, to DOE, um, I, I imagine there will be a shift in expectations and there will be a shift in who is going to be interacting with the providers and the educators there. Uh, if there's going to be some superintendent or some position in the DOE that now has to be the person overseeing the program, you know, to make sure that the providers first have time to process the expectations of the, the, of the Department of Education um, because you just you can't just rush things and, and, and you know, I want to just b make clear that folks from the DOE uh, have expertise in this field, uh, that there are clear expectations that are passed on to providers even before the, it, it, it takes place. That should already be happening, quite frankly, um, and uh, to minimize any disruption um, to, to instruction. I, I have one more question. I'll turn it to my co-chair. One of the primary concerns for the expansion as well for pre-K and 3K is the um, potential exacerbation of overcrowding in DOE school buildings. While a majority of, of, of pre-K and 3K students may currently be served in CBOs, a large number are enrolled in DOE facilities, pri primarily elementary schools, 57% of which are already overcrowded, um, according to reports. Uh, what percentage of pre-K and 3K students are currently uh, currently attend programs in, in DOE facilities? Um, so for pre-K, um, it's about 40% in district school facilities and about 60% in community-based settings. Uh, for 3K, um, so far, we're, cl we're at closer to 50-50, though. It will vary, especially as the new districts come online, so I'll give you information as we go there. And are any uh, pre-K programs located in buildings that are over capacity? We, so uh, we believe, uh, so the short answer is there are, there, all of our programs are located in buildings where the school leader and school community feel like they can do a good job providing uh, pre-K and 3K. And we work very care carefully with school leaders, uh, with superintendents, and with local elected officials such as yourselves to make sure that we're striking that balance. And so if there are particular issues um, in any of your districts that you want to raise, we're wide open to working with you on those. Um, but the short answer is we believe that they're all in spaces that can handle it and where leaders are enthusiastic and teachers are too. I, I just want to make clear for the record that capacity in, capacity in school does have a very big impact on instruction. Uh, and there are some school districts that we can't even fulfill the promise of UPK or 3K because they're so overcrowded. And so in, in, my, in my part of town, and Councilman Brendan could also attest to this, District 20 is one of the most overcrowded districts in New York City. They, can, they are having a very hard time finding sites. So you can't fulfill the promise of universal when it's not universal across the five boroughs in every region of the five boroughs. So this is, this is a big issue, but I want to be mindful of my colleagues and their time, so I'm going to turn over now to uh, uh, Chair uh, Levin. Thank you very much, Chair Traeger. Um, so I can't help but be very disappointed with the answers regarding pay parity that we just received. First off, uh, the UFT pay schedule is posted on the UFT website. That is certainly information that uh, you all should have uh, in preparing for this testimony, um, this hearing. So, um, you know, um, I have half a mind to adjourn the hearing and get that information uh, and, and bring it back. But I think in, uh, in the interest of everybody's time, I will ask, but it just in general, what I did not hear um, was an acknowledgement, big picture, that we have a significantly disparate pay structure, compensation structure, benefit structure between UFT represented DOE, early childhood education teachers, 
1707 represented it represented CBO early childhood education teachers. Now keep in mind, and we all know this, but I want to say this for the record, the CBO teachers, the 1707 teachers, are working 12 months a year. They're working till six o'clock at night, uh, so they don't get this. They get they work more hours for less money. Are are do you have with you a comparison chart that shows year over year what the pay disparity is between these two, the U of T teachers and the 1707 teachers, both with BAs and MAs? I don't. Okay, I do. Okay. So, um, I want to thank uh, Citizens Committee for Children for providing this. Um, but obviously if they got it, we could have it. Um, and so I'll just read it now. Now, actually, this is based on May 2018 numbers. And so the schedule that we read off just now for UFT teachers is, is actually been updated. So the, dis the disparity has actually increased uh, from this. But I'm just going to read this onto the record. For, this is for, for bachelor's accredited teachers, salary progression. First year, uh, 1707 CBO, 41,265. UFT DOE 55059. So that's about, you know, it's about a $14,000 difference. Starting salary with a bachelor's. Um, that second year, uh, DC 1707 CBO 41,765. And uh, UFT DOE 56,153. So they both increased by, uh, you know, a few hundred bucks. Uh, the next year, uh, th third year, 42,265 versus 56,618. The following year, 42,765 versus 57,437. The next year, it's 43,465 versus 58,147. The next year, it's 44, this is now year six, 44,065 versus 61,150. The next year, year seven, 44,065, so that pay doesn't even increase, versus 66,515. Um, when you get to year eight for a bachelor's accredited teacher in a CBO 1707, 44,065 versus 74,207. That is a $30,000 a year difference yeah. when you get to year eight. That's with bachelors. When we go to masters. <laughs> masters, first year, 46,920 versus 61,894. So that's about uh, $15,000 difference, $14,000 difference. Next year is 47,220 versus 62,998. The next year is 47,520 versus 63,453. The following year is 47,820 versus 64,272. The next year is 48, so now we're on year five, 48,320 versus 64,982. The next year, year six, 48,920 versus 67,985. So there, at that point, we're at a $19,000 difference. The following year, the same as with the bachelor, 1707 stays the same between year six and seven, 48,920 versus 73,350. The following year, year eight, same, the, the uh, DC 1707 CBO teacher stays the same, 48,920. Now, I know that this, is, this has gone up now for a, a master's to hit 50,000 in 2020, but this is today. Mm -hmm. And the master's year eight UFT, 81,042. So that difference is now $32,000 a year difference. It is so wildly disparate that it, on its face, is so obvious that it undermines the effectiveness of this system. We cannot, cannot, have a two-tiered system where you have, I mean, why would anybody, why on earth would anybody want to work 
when their career path shows them that after eight years of dedicating themselves, working 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day, taking care of our children in a CBO setting, making sure that parents don't have to leave work at 3 o'clock, you know, putting in all of that time, why on earth would anyone want to do that when they're, when they're, they're set to make $30,000 less? Then their counterpart. Why wouldn't they just say the city's expanding the UPK programs? They're expanding the three K programs. Of course, I'm going to go work at the at the DOE. Why would I go work at a CBO? I mean, it just it, it's on its face. I mean, people would have to, you know, they, they they'd have to really be dedicated to working in the CBO setting uh, to do it for for thirty thousand dollars a year less every year, every year. You take that out over the course of an entire career, I mean, that's, you know, you're working for 20 years, 30 years, $30,000 a year less, you know, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a house. Yeah. So I, I just, I, 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 I mean, <laughs> New York City, it's, it's, you know. <laughs> um, but really, I mean, I just don't get the sense, I'm not blaming you all, I don't think, I mean, just to your point also about, well, this was a deal between the daycare council and 1707. I've talked to the daycare council and 1707. They weren't given the resources to negotiate a fair contract with 1707. Daycare council would obviously want to have pay parity. It's in their interest to have pay parity. The city of New York, Office of Labor Relations, the mayor of the city of New York did not give the daycare council enough resources to negotiate a contract that was on par with, with, with the DOE teacher. So I'm not blaming you all, but I just have not, never, never, in, year, in several years of talking about this issue, never gotten an acknowledgement from the city that they but really see this as a serious problem that has to get fixed. And the only way it gets fixed is with funds, resources, money, dedicated to this. And so I guess my question is, and I hope you have the answer to this, to get on full parity, full parity, how much would that cost per year? Do we know that? I don't. Um, I don't. Um, and I think. We need um, to find out. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and um, a lot of what we're, you know, I think a lot of what we're doing as we go around the city is sort of learning and listening about the dimension of this problem. So um, I don't have the answer. Okay. It's, this is so essential to the health of this system because I'm, I am concerned. And I applaud UPK, pre-K for all. I, I applaud all the work that you did to implement that. I applaud all the work that Lorelei has done to stabilize early learn. I mean, I, I, I'm looking at the numbers here of enrollment in contracted care. Between FY10 and FY14, 15, when Lorelei came in, that system contracted by 35% maybe. I mean, it went from 48,609 to 30,422. And it's stabilized since then, but it dropped so precip precipitously. I am concerned that, that all of these wonderful options that we're providing in our school system are going to totally undermine the, the, uh, the contracted care system. And so that's a big, big concern. So I, I guess, so sorry, that's my soapbox. What, what 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 lessons have, have have we learned going into this process from the first early learn contract and from how UPK affected early learn? So I go two part question. What if what's what are the two what are the takeaways from each of those circumstances at this point? I'll take the second part, um, which is the UPK or part of the second part rather, which is the part about the interaction between UPK and early learn. Um, I think that uh, the approach that we're taking, um, um, that we've taken and will continue to take, is again to acknowledge that um, the organizations that have been providing these services and supports in our communities for years and sometimes decades 
are really the cornerstone, the linchpin of this effort. And so as we go out, for example, to expand 3K, we begin by talking with the existing community-based providers, um, with Head Start and child care agencies, early learn um, uh, uh, contracted agencies, to see if they want to expand. Um, and that's our first stop. Um, it's only after we've exhausted those opportunities that we then look for um, spaces in district schools to try to add to the system, to add the capacity we, we want to add. So we're trying very hard as we go. We won't get it perfectly, and we'll need your help, I think, to, 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 to do it even better. We'll need your input and advice and your connection to providers. But our goal here is to add to um, an incredibly high-performing system, to add capacity. Um, so to take what exists and put more on top of it to increase access. That's one of the main lessons I think DOE has learned um, from our work with Early Learn. So, um, I mean, we've learned a lot around Early Learn and through our work with Early Learn. Um, you know, I think w even where we are today versus where we were when Early Learn was first launched, we know more about the importance of early childhood education. I mean, there's way more research um, that tells us that these are the important years and these are the years where we need to be investing heavily. And so, you know, this administration has taken that on in terms of, you know, the investments. That being said, I think, you know, we've, we've certainly seen, we've gone through growing pains. Um, and, you know, when I, when I first came in and, and pre-K was being implemented, it was the same time. Um, and, um, you know, we immediately partnered with uh, the Department of Education to figure out how do we minimize some of the stressors that some of the providers were experiencing because of the dual systems. Mm -hmm. And we've worked very closely together over the course of the last um, three, three years to try to minimize kind of, you know, multiple standards and, you know, different regulations as much as we could. Um, you know, I think ultimately, what, what we know and appreciate as a system is that at the core of these, you know, child care centers are families who have very real needs and communities that have very real needs. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the work that we are doing um, over at ACS and the launch of the new division of child and family well-being is really focused on, you know, the belief that there are needs, but there are incredible strengths in these communities as well. And what we need to do is look at those strengths and figure out how do we build on those strengths and partner with other city agencies to leverage existing investments that are being made and systems that exist. And so, you know, we've learned a lot, you know, over the course of the last three years. It is, you know, we've gone through some real growing pains, um, but, there has never been a lack of desire to try to sit down and figure it out. I'm, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues who have questions, and then and then I'll come back on a second. Councilmember Lander. Uh, thank you to both chairs and to, to all my colleagues, and I'll just associate myself both with the praise for the work that has been done around early childhood education, the extraordinary steps forward that have been taken and with the passionate commitment to getting to pay parity for all the reasons that we're talking about, both because it's the right thing to do and because the system doesn't work otherwise given the incentives that are created. Um, but my question is on an, another element of the early childhood system, and it's one that we've also been working together on for quite some time now around uh, integration across socioeconomic and racial and ethnic groups in our systems, and we are starting to make some good progress on that in middle schools and high schools. Um, there are some real challenges, and there's some wonderful things like the K-280 program at PS10, which is an extraordinarily integrated pre-K program. Obviously, there have been some, pro some of those programs which are really integrated and some which are not. It is especially challenging in the early learn and, and two- and three-year-old systems. There are some wonderful programs like the Helen Owen Carey uh, program that, that we've talked about in the past, which is half subsidized and half private pay. So you both expand the number of seats and achieve really integrated early childhood education. Um, and I would just like to know what, if any, steps are being taken as we expand the system uh, to try to make that more the reality. Because if we don't do that, then we're certainly going to wind up with a fully segregated early childhood system where in some places there's 100% subsidized uh, education for low-income kids, and in other places there's 100% 
market rate fee-based education for some other kids, um, which will mean they don't show up equally ready in a lot of cases. And um, in any case, we lose on a lot of, a lot on the out. Of, excuse me, we lose out on a lot of the opportunities. So I'll start. I would say um, first of all, um, we agree with the with, with the goal. We would like to see. Um, uh, greater diversity in early childhood programs um, and classrooms um, because we believe that um, children learn more and better in diverse programs and classrooms. So we share that goal with you. I think there are two things I would say. One is um, we have started um, um, in at the Department of Education um, with some diverse, what we call diversity and admission pilot programs in early childhood programs, which started in K through 12 where programs are intentionally setting um, priorities for students that meet certain criteria that um, are low income or in temporary housing or um, um, face a another a type of hardship crisis in their lives. Um, I think going forward, this is an area we would like to explore further with you. I think as we ramp up to do a new, um, a new procurement for birth to five services um, with a new um, contract starting in 2020, we are looking hard at ways that we can make it easier for programs um, to uh, integrate their programs in classrooms um, and the way that we can make the structures um, work better to facilitate that. Um, so I think we'll be coming to you with some more concrete ideas about that in the months ahead. Um, um, so we look forward to that discussion, but we share that goal. So I'll just end with this. I think perhaps the chair's idea of a concept paper that looks at some of these questions, it seems to me these things might be able to go together. There are certainly plenty of places where parents are already paying a meaningful amount more than the early, the early learn contract provides for childcare. I don't know what that looks like at Helen Owen Carey and how their schedule fits in, but it just seems to me we should look at these things together because it's, this is not just a diversity and admissions question. This is also a funding streams question. Obviously, when we can get to 3K for all, that's a different issue. But so long as non-low-income New Yorkers are paying for child care, then the opportunity to grow the system uh, in inclusive ways that achieve the goals that we have for pay parity, but also the goals we have for high-quality integrated education will be good to try to meet together. So I hope we can work on that. Thank you very much. Councilmember Grudenchik. Thank you, Chair uh, Levin. Thank you, Chair Traeger. Um, I just want to follow up uh, what uh, the chairs have said and what my colleague Brad Lander has said and put some historical uh, context into this. Um, I started working on this issue uh, when I first attended a meeting for uh, my mentor hero, uh, former boss Nettie Mayerson, uh, in 1987. The meeting was at Varick Street, and it was at DC 1707's headquarters uh, when they were located on Varick Street. And I say that just to give you some idea how long people have been pushing. This is over 30 years now, and that's when I got to the fight. I don't know how much further it goes back, but this is a generational fight. And we can't have fundamental fairness in this city, and the mayor talks about this all the time, and we believe in fundamental fairness. We, we, that's a slogan, right? So. Um, I'm a kid who grew up in public housing. Um, I don't think I went to a CBO. I kind of remember, maybe, but I went to New York City Public Schools. And we have got to have fairness, um, and we need to know what it's going to cost. We need to know these answers. And we don't want to be here. I don't want somebody who succeeds me a generation from now to be talking to the future Mr. Wallach or, you know, whoever is sitting in that chair. Um, we've got to deal with this issue now, and we absolutely need to know what it's going to cost. This is a city with a big heart. Um, I think we are doing a tremendous disservice, uh, certainly to the teachers and certainly to the students, um, when we have a two-tier system. So we need to get going on this, and we need to get going on this now. And I want to thank, I don't have any questions for you, but I just wanted to put a historical context on this. I don't know where you were 30 years ago. Um, I know where I was. I don't know where my chairs were. They're probably still in grade school, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm a little older and a, and a little, I don't know if I'm wiser, but maybe a little more seasoned. So early I, school. early grade school. Um, I thank you for listening to me, and um, I am very uh, happy. I have to leave now to attend some meetings, but I want to thank you for being here today, and I certainly want to thank both of my chairs for holding this hearing on this 
very, very important topic for our children. Thank you. Councilor Barron. Thank you to the chairs and thank you to the panel for coming. Uh, you know, I used to teach school. I was a assistant principal and a principal. If you had come to my class as you came today, not having hard data, you wouldn't have gotten an A for the day because you would have been, in my opinion, unprepared. Knowing what the topic was and knowing what our focus was to not bring that data. So I always believe in uh, doing better. So next time you come, Hopefully you'll be prepared and have all those kinds of data and have brought uh, reports that have been issued by advocates and done an analysis of that and given us some direction on how you intend to improve. The Board of Education, I, I'm, I'm dating myself, the Department of Education has been experiencing a downward trend in the number of black and Latino faculty, teachers, and administrators. What do you show, if you have the data, as the number of black and Latino teachers in these early childhood programs? I don't have the exact figures um, with me, uh, but I will, I will get you what we have. Um, I would just say that, just quickly, that um, um, in our effort to recruit and retain the very best, um, um, part of that is recruiting a diverse uh, workforce, a diverse group of teachers um, that represent all parts of New York City. So we agree with that goal. Uh, and following up perhaps in the trend of my colleague Brad Lander in talking about how schools are so uh, very much in columns, in, col in silos based on ethnicity, what are the requirements or what is the opportunity for a parent living in a particular zip code of registering her child or his child in a zip code closer to where they may work and they'll be able to have the opportunity to bring the child home when they leave work? So um, at the moment in pre-K, and um, in pre-K for all, um, a family can choose a program anywhere in the city. Um, so they fill out an application. Um, they can work with one of our outreach workers to find a location that's convenient to their home, where they work, where a relative lives or works. They fill out their preferences and they're matched with a program, uh, the highest choice program that has uh, a spot. And we have a good track record of providing people with their top choice or one of their top three choices. Um, and for 3K, we are building that system as well. Um, so the goal, I think, is to provide as much flexibility for families as possible, both to increase access and also to increase the opportunities um, to create diverse and integrated uh, classrooms and programs. And do you have any data as to the number of parents who choose to place their child outside of their immediate community? I don't have the exact figures here, but I will say that a lot of families choose to choose a program or setting very close to home. Um, so um, so then I would like to know how many who would like to have one away from home yeah. are satisfied and, and get that. I'll, I'll look I'd at like the, I would say overall, um, each year we wind up with um, a figure somewhere in the 70s or 80% uh, range of, of families that get their top choice or one of their top choices. So we are able to work with families who want to have a program that's close to where they work, for example, as well. And what is the ratio uh, of, of uh, the child-teacher ratio in these two programs? So I think it's the same across the board. It's, um, it's two adults for 18 kids for four-year-olds and 15 kids for three-year-olds. And if you add more than that um, to the number of students you add, you have to add another adult. Um, and the total cap for four-year-olds is 20. And for three-year-olds is, I believe, 18. 17, sorry, 17. I think that ratio, I, I, that's the same as what a kindergarten teacher has. A teacher with a para, we had paras, and we had about uh, 15 to 20 students in a class, especially if it was a half day. I think that seems kind of high. As I think back to my sons when they were three years old, um, I think that 
I would not have felt comfortable with knowing that there was one adult who was charged with an additional seven children to take care of. Well, there are two, so it's... There are two adults. Right, so there are two adults. So one, basically, is taking care of seven, and the other is taking care of eight. Yes? There are, there are two adults for 15 kids. I think they work right. as and teams. And if we divide it up, yes. they may work as yes, teams. But I if hear we you. Do, right. If we do one-to-one, -to, -one, to think that there's one person who's looking at my three-year-old uh, along with seven other children, um, sometimes I think that it's a difficult choice for parents to do that, to realize that uh, that's a ratio that might not be sufficient. And especially talking about three-year-olds that need a lot of nurturing, perhaps some cuddling, and I don't know how that's going to play out You know, in this day and age where it's basically hands off, that may need some cuddling and uh, encouragement. So I'm concerned that that's the ratio that you have. I would have liked to have seen it a lower ratio. Council Member um, mm -hmm. Barron, if I, if I could add that in our early learn programs, you know, the ratios that we use are, are set by the Department of Health um, through Article 47. Right. Um, however, in many early learn programs, we have programs that have great partnerships with um, universities, partnerships right. with um, uh, senior centers where volunteers come in and add to that because we do need cuddlers. Um, children do need, um, you know, hands-on interaction. And so, um, you know, we, we find that a lot of our programs, and frankly, when I ran a program, I also depended very heavily on volunteers as well to, you know, to kind of fill, fill the gap sometimes um, when you need a couple of extra, you know, adults to hold a child's hand or soothe a child um, if they're crying or they're upset. Um, so, you know, we find that a lot of our programs do that and they tap into programs across the, the city, whether it's, you know, universities and colleges mm -hmm. who have students who want to come and, and do work in the center or aging, you know, uh, senior programs, um, DIFTA, um, where seniors want to come in and do a story time or they want to come in and just sit with the kids during circle, circle time. Or and in, ter in terms of... Uh, opportunities to explore some of the great cultural centers that we have here in the city. What is the provision for that? Are children taken on trips? Do they have school buses that would transport them? And how often does that occur? So I'll start. Um, in, with early learn programs, you might remember a couple of years ago, we switched to having a line item budget. Um, we encouraged our providers to include um, programs like that, trips, um, additions for children, so that, you know, we live in New York City and we want the children to be able to experience the city. That being said, they are very little kids. And, um, and so, you know, when we think about school trips, like in a K through 12 program, it is a little different um, than, you know, thinking about an early childhood program. Mm -hmm. um, in buses, we need... Um, um, car seats, um, oh, okay. yes, and so you know the you know how programs go about obtaining car seats, purchasing car seats, keeping car seats, storing car seats. That sometimes become a bar becomes a barrier. Now we live in New York and we have a great public transportation system, and so we have programs um, that will do things like, for example, if they're um, um, with the Head Start curriculum, if they're learning about. Um, Flowers. They might take a trip to the local community garden. Um, they might take a trip in their community so that the children can become more and more familiar with their community. They might go visit the fire department. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of that kind of local trips so that children become familiar with their community and their surroundings and other residents become familiar with the children as well. Um, and, you know, there are also opportunities, and we have programs that have, you know, been able to get children on a train to go to the Bronx Zoo or to right. take them to see a special movie or, you know, to take them to see some of the other cultural institutions in the city. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You. I'm sorry. I have to leave now, but I'll be back. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question for the uh, Deputy Commissioner. Um, we, asked, we asked earlier about... Um, the number of vacancies. Uh, is it just that you didn't have that with you today or you don't collect that data in general? 
No, we don't have, I don't have it with me today, so I don't want to give you a number that's not accurate. But I'm happy to share an accurate number with you. And putting aside the, the accurate number, have you heard from providers and from communities about the high number of vacancies and the teacher retention issues? So we work very closely with our programs. It's not, it's not something that you know, comes to us as a surprise to us. We have heard, you know, programs have raised concerns that it is difficult to, to retain um, staff. And um, with those programs, we, you know, have done a variety of different things. We've connected them to DOE, as, as um, Deputy Chancellor Wallach was sharing before, um, to see if they can, you know, um, help with their HR office in terms of um, um, attracting teachers. And we just provide as much support as we can to, to those programs. But yes, we, we, we have heard that. I, mean, I imagine dealing with DOE HR, they're dealing with folks who want to work for the DOE at DOE rates and salaries. I mean, that's, that's, that's the issue. Um, it's, I, you know, again, the early learn was, has been under ACS. This was not over, uh, this was not under the helm of DOE until next year, but I'm just trying to figure out the quality review and from, from, from your department, when you consistently hear feedback from providers that they're having difficulty attracting, retaining people, if, I, I imagine someone from your office visits sites, is that right? Mm -hmm. yes. How often? Um, we go out about every six weeks. Right, and has anyone from your staff ever, ever reported back to you that this provider still has a vacancy or there's vacancy concerns here, have you heard that? Again, we do track, we track vacancies in our system. Can you provide that data to us uh, after, at, uh, to this committee? Sure, as I shared, uh, I'd right. be happy to kind of share that information. Okay, and uh, so what feedback do you, how do you then ensure quality uh, early, early childhood education when there's no one there or when they have difficulty uh, filling in these gaps? Well, one, I wouldn't say that there's no one there. Um, we have many incredible and highly qualified teachers who work in our system. And as somebody shared earlier, you know, it is, they are showing up every day. They are there 12 months a year. Um, they are with the children. They're supporting the families. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that we don't have anyone there. Um, you know, have we, have we had issues with, with teachers you know, moving over um, into the other system, yes, and that's an issue, as Deputy Chancellor Wallach said, is one that, you know, as we're hearing, trying to figure out how do you resolve that, that particular issue, but also from an ACS standpoint, how do we support the program to ensure that quality, that the level of quality we've been able to bring the system up to um, is sustained. Right, and I'm not suggesting that there's no adults in the room, but there's, a, there's, there's different position titles, is that correct? Yes. Right, there's head teachers, is that right? Yes. There are assistant teachers, is that right? And right. So I, I, what I'm saying is that these are the head teacher positions that folks are having difficulty uh, re retaining, is that, is that right? Um, I, I can't say for sure. Right, now have you, and so hearing feedback from uh, uh, people that work uh, for you and visit providers, have you raised this issue with, so who do you report to as far as, I, I mentioned to the ACS commissioner, have you had conversations, who is the deputy mayor that oversees, for example, uh, ACS? Um, it's uh, Dr. Minia Palacio. And, and have conversations reached uh, t to her level? I don't, I don't meet with her directly, my commissioner does. Right, but have you heard, have you asked your commissioner to raise this with superiors in the past? Um, I've shared th these issues. These, these issues are not secret. Right. It's not a surprise. Right. Um, these are issues that are well known in our system. I think our advocates and our providers are well aware. Um, you know, the issues have been um, documented by advocates. And so, you know, it's an issue that, that we are aware of. And again, from an ACS perspective, as we're going through this transition, our focus has been in trying to maintain the quality that we've been able to bring to this system. 
you know, because we are cognizant of the fact that we are serving children, you know, across the city, and we want to make sure that the quality of early care and education services that these children receive is up to par. Right, and, and, I, and I appreciate all that. It's just that when I deal with other uh, agencies, departments, for example, when I deal with cases of NYCHA, for example, the former NYCHA chair would say she would bring it to the attention of folks who oversee her to ask for more money and ask OMB for more money. So we just passed an $89 billion budget. In the city council, in our budget response, we did push for the issue of parity. I am not clear why the administration did not get this done when clearly the money is there. If anyone could speak to that. I think, again, as has been said, um, this is an issue that we believe will be resolved, should be resolved at the bargaining table. Um, and we are, we are aware of the challenges and continue to uh, go and visit with providers, as the Deputy Chancellor and Deputy Commissioner have said. Yeah. Inter interject for a second. Um, the, the recent announcement that U of T did with the mayor last week around paid parental leave, was that done uh, was that a contract amendment, or was that something that was like uh, done as part of a new contract with the UFT? Uh, I'm not familiar with the specifics of, of the agreement. Okay, um, I'm pretty sure that that was a contract amendment. Uh, as far as I know, I mean, I don't know anyone else know in this room whether the UFT contract is up or whether this was done as part of a, whether this is a contract amendment. Pretty sure it was a contract amendment. So I, I just to kind of answer my co-chair's question. From before, I don't. I don't think that there's anything that precludes the administration from entering into negotiations around pay parity um, during the course of a contract, uh, and not waiting until a contract negotiation is. You know that there's a whole new contract negotiation. For it. I mean, I don't. I'm pretty sure that that's not what just happened with the UFT on um, on paid parental leave. Sorry, I'm old. <laughs> you, <laughs> uh, well, are you testifying? Uh, signed up to testify. Sorry, we don't, we don't, uh, you could, if you want to maybe write it down and we'll, I'll read into the record. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's my understanding that nothing in the law prohibits the administration right now from engaging good faith conversations uh, with stakeholders to address this issue. And what, what I am trying to grapple with from the DOE's point of view is that when superintendents and, and people from Tweed visit schools today. Mm -hmm. Teacher retention is a measurable item that they hold schools accountable for. That's a major issue because it speaks to the stability of the school. Mm -hmm. So if this is now all being transferred over to DOE and we're hearing that there are people with expertise and experience who know what they're doing who are going to be overseeing this, how in good conscience can we say that we are providing you know, the best opportunities for kids knowing that there's already retention problems right now? That's, that's what I am trying to, trying to grapple with here. Mm -hmm. We know this problem exists. This is nothing new. As we heard from the Deputy Commissioner, the advocates and folks have known about this for quite some time. You can't say that the city doesn't have money because the city's budget has blossomed to close to $90 billion now. And everyone's talking about, a, a, you know, at this time, the revenue is coming in. Uh, we keep hearing about equity and excellence for all, but apparently except for CBO provider teachers. They're not a part of the fairness equation at this point. And again, as I mentioned before, this has a reverberating effect for their financial bottom line, but also we have to speak up for the kids uh, who see turnover and communities that are promised these programs that can't really deliver what they're saying they're, they're promising to deliver. So you have families here who are impacted financially. You have communities that are being shortchanged. 
and yet programs not being given the ability to fulfill the promise uh, of, of what they've pledged to do. So, and if it's one, it's one thing if we knew that there, there, are, no, there are no funds. The co-chair and I sit on the budget negotiating team in the city council. There's a lot of money. This is a matter of doing just the right thing. And it's the right thing to resolve this issue now, once and for all. Um, now, I want to recognize we've been also joined by council members uh, Ayala, Gibson, Deutsch, Reynoso, and Salamanca. Uh, and I just, uh, any other, my colleagues have any questions? Uh, council member Reynoso. So I just, <laughs> I don't want to beat a dead horse here, um, but I just don't want us to look back at this in six months and actually have the parity and that a lot of the testimony and the work that we did here is for not. Um, so I just wanna uh, lend my voice to, to what I'm hearing from our chairs um, for, for this hearing. This is, this is a, uh, uh, not a if it's gonna happen, but when it's gonna happen. So it's just better that we, 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 we're mindful of that. Many times in like NYPD policy, people, you know, they dig their heels in and then two months later we come out and you know, we're not arresting people for marijuana. Um, this pay parity stuff is definitely something that has to happen and that is going to happen. So it's just um, unfortunate that you have to sit here today like on the wrong side of that. And, and that's part of what I just really wanna make sure I, I echo with my, with my colleagues. So I just wanted to make that statement in general regarding this hearing and then I have more questions later on for, for a different panel. But thank you, thank you, Chairs. Um, a question for the uh, DOE with regards to capital needs for sites. Uh, I understand that DOH provides the, the licensing, is that correct? Yes. Um, but I imagine that the DOE might have its own set of expectations that might be similar or different than the expectations of ACS. Is that correct? DOE and ACS both follow the Department of Health's Article 47 uh, regulations for our facilities. So there's complete alignment with regards to expectations of a physical space? We both fully follow the health code. Right, but I'm just saying, is a, a visitor from the DOE gonna come visit a site and say, where is this, this shouldn't be here, because these are already providers that are kind of stretched thin, mm -hmm. and if they are being required to make any type of capital improvements or capital changes, I'm just wondering if there's any capital support that goes along with this transition. For existing providers, there are no changes in the code that they're required to follow. Uh, when new providers apply to work with us through the procurements that we've run in the past or future procurements, we do offer the opportunity for providers to apply for startup funds if there are specific elements of their facility that they need support to upgrade. Okay, um, I mean, I think that we've pretty, we've made our case here pretty clear. I think you've heard it from, from our colleagues. Uh, the city council will not stop uh, focusing and fighting on this issue because it, it has enormous impact uh, beyond just this room. Uh, this reaches our communities and um, we, we wanna make sure the administration at the highest level understands that. We will continue to make our voices heard um, to provide fairness and equity. Again, I go back to my original statement, equal pay for equal work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a issue of fundamental fairness in a city that boasts that it's the big, the fairest city in, in the country. Um, it, with that, uh, my uh, my co-chair will close it out. I just want to uh, actually amend that. It's, it's equal pay for more work. Right. Yeah. Work more hours yeah. and more months out of the year. Um, uh, uh, first off, I want to just acknowledge that the person that uh, in, in the audience that uh, spoke up is uh, said that they're, they are a UFT uh, teacher and that uh, the uh, the contract process was actually moved back several months in order to allow for this announcement, th th this negotiation to happen between the administration, the o o uh, OLR and, uh, and the UFT. Um, so moved back from November 18 to February of 19. So there's, there is, I think, flexibility within the um, contract negotiating process to allow for something like this to happen. Again, I just wanna say that I've been talking to daycare council for years about this. They would be 
thrilled to be able to provide 1707 with a contract that's paid parity with, with GOT teachers. They were not given the resources by this administration to be able to do that. that that's a, that's so it's, it's, it's not on them. They didn't have, they can't print money mm -hmm. to be able to do that. So and they don't control, they don't control uh, the, the city budget. So, um, uh, sorry, with, with regard to just the process here, is there, a, is there any federal um, uh, approval that is needed, um, uh, whether uh, moving federal CCDBG or state child care block grant funding, uh, approval from the state or the federal government that is required to allow for um, these programs to move over from, and that goes also for Head Start, um, uh, move from ACS, which is part of the Social Services District to Department of Education? Uh, so for Head Start, the grant that ACS currently holds uh, with the Office of Head Start is expiring in 2019. The DOE will be applying this fall through the Head Start open competitive grant process uh, to uh, receive the grant funds uh, for the new grant that would begin in July of 2019. For the child care block grant dollars, um, we have submitted a proposal to the st state um, to seek their approval uh, for our plans. Are there any other federal approvals that would be uh, needed? No, not at this time. Um, and are there contingencies? I mean, are we expecting those approvals to be granted, or are there contingencies for if they're not granted? If they're not granted, I imagine it would be very hard to do this entire transfer. Uh, for the uh, transfer of the block grant dollars, we have been working closely with the State Office of Children and Family Services and will continue to engage in discussions with them over the next year to plan for a successful transition. Um, there, uh, with regard to the direct lease sites, mm -hmm. um, those are uh, currently overseen by DCAS, so anybody that's been in the council long enough like, has gotten somehow involved in a direct lease site for an early childhood program. And we all kind of all know what that's like. It's, uh, I, I imagine it takes up a whole lot of Lorelei and Allison's uh, time. Uh, and um, I, that is, that's a DCAS, you know, that's a DCAS, uh, they're the lead agency on that. With DOE, I mean, uh, DOE I'm assuming does not directly lease private space. I mean, is there anything in the DOE portfolio where it involves leasing private space, and and do you oversee that, or do you contract with D DCAS, I mean, or do, do you do, uh, do you allow DCAS to be the lead agency, or is that an SCA, I mean, what's the what's the mechanics of that? DOE primarily works with the School Construction Authority on lease sites. Okay, um, so that would be the process moving forward? I mean, these leases are with DCAS, right? So some of these leases are like 10, 20 year leases. Yes, we are going lease by lease uh, as we go through this transition process to work through the process to transition those over as part of the broader early learn transition. To SCA leases? We're working with DCAS and SCA to determine the specifics of how we'll execute the transfers. And that'll be the same across the board or that will be site by site? Some sites will have a DCAS lease, some sites will have an SCA lease or is it gonna be kind of a standard operating procedure? On It'll that? be a standard, but because the leases expire at different times and many of them are up for renegotiation over the next year, um, we're going through them in more of a rolling process. Okay. Um, DCAS has experience with this. I don't, does S, I mean, does SCA have a lot of, what else, what, give an, can you give an example of what else in the DOE's portfolio is a direct lease site? Sure, for example, the pre-K centers that mm -hmm. um, exist across the city, the standalone facilities that serve uh, four-year-olds and in some cases now three-year-olds, many of those are leased sites. And those are SCA. Yes, SCA holds those leases. Um, so taking another direction here for a moment, um, what are we doing to ensure that pre-K for all, if the plan is to move that out across the city by 2021, is not, um, you know, taking children away from the CBO contracted site. How does, how, w how does that, how are we expecting to maintain, I guess the question is how do we expect to maintain a level of enrollment in the CBOs with 3K for all coming uh, down the pike? And then 
Um, what are our target numbers for contracted care uh, as as DOE is taking over this system? Do we know? Do have we determined what the target number is? So we measure demand as we look across the city for 3K um, based in part on the patterns we've seen in pre-K applications over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And as we calculate both the demand that we see for 3K services and the supply that will be needed in each individual neighborhood to meet that demand, we take into account the existing CBO capacity uh, because we want to ensure that those providers are able to maximize their enrollment and continue to run sustainable businesses. And so as we expand, we are continuing to use a mixed delivery model where we're working with CBOs, including current early learn providers and current DOE providers, as well as new providers who are able to come in as we run procurements. And then we look to space in our district school facilities as well, but all with an eye towards ensuring that our CBO providers, uh, who are a vital part of our expansion, are able to maximize enrollment. So then do you, do you anticipate that there will be a enrollment of 30,000 contracted spots in early learn programs when DOE takes over this, con this, this system? Our goal is to maximize enrollment to capacity in the early learn programs as we take over the system. So then that would be 30,000? Yes, though that includes the full age range of six weeks to uh, five years old in that 30,000 number. So then does, is, are we looking at expanding infant and toddler slots throughout the system? As we take those over? So as we take over the current contracts, um, they will remain as they are over time. We would, we would like to, with available um, resources, of course, see an expansion as we know there is a great need across the city for uh, high quality, free and affordable infant and toddler care as well. So then, so then we, just to be clear, we do not anticipate a decrease in the capacity of contracted sites when Early Learn moves over from ACS to DOE? No, we do not anticipate a decrease. Um, can you describe right now, is, is DOE open to the idea of doing a concept paper? I think we are committed to ensuring a transparent and fair process for procurement and we are looking at um, the best way to roll that out to ensure providers uh, and community members understand how to apply. Okay, I strongly recommend. I, I'm gonna give you uh, my perspective. I, I'm in my third term at the city council. My first term was when Early Learn rolled out. Mm -hmm. And um, throughout that term, dealing with the fallout from Early Learn took on more and more of a prominent space in my and my staff's lives mm -hmm. because, um, because of, of what happened through that contracting process. It didn't go well. And uh, we had providers that were 40-year providers that lost a contract by two points. I had one provider that uh, scored an average of 82, and then uh, they there was some disparity between their three scores, so then they went back and they got scored again, and that 82 went down to 65. They lost their contract, they were a 40-year provider. Um, that's not that unusual. I had providers who lost their contract because one provider got 17 contracts, you know, because they just applied for everything and just got awarded 17 contracts. It, it really, it was, I mean, it was a real, it was a real problem. Um, and it took up a lot of people's time at a certain point, this city council took on $60 million worth of, of early childhood education contracts because we had to keep programs running and afloat while early learning got cleaned up. Um, so I strongly recommend doing a concept paper. Now that actually had a concept, mm -hmm. but I strongly rep recommend having an earnest effort and system to ensure that that doesn't happen again because it, it took a long time and a lot of effort and a lot of extra money that this city had to put into the system, $60 million extra a year to keep the system, to keep programs from, from closing their doors. 
Um, it's just not a way to to run a system. We have an opportunity here mm -hmm. uh, to um, to make sure that a transition goes smoothly. And so I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend having everybody around the table in a very formal process um, so that there are no unanticipated um, problems and unintended consequences mm -hmm. that could really make for um, you know real problems down the line. Mm -hmm. So I, I strongly recommend that a concept paper be implemented here. I know that DOE doesn't do concept papers. I think this is one instance. This is unusual. This is an unusual circumstance here. I think that I think that we can make an exception to the rule. Um, uh, staff moving over from ACS to DOE. Mm -hmm. How is that working? Does do staff is staff given a choice to stay at ACS or go to DOE, or how is that kind of how many staff are we talking about moving over from one agency to the other, and kind of how is that playing out, or is is that still in process? Uh, we're still in process. We're working with the Office of Labor Relations, uh, with DCAS, and with others throughout the administration to execute a functional transfer process. Um, since the functions will be moving from one agency to the other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, last question. We actually, th this administration put forward recommendations in 2015 um, on what to do. I have the report here. It was the New York City Early Care and Education Task Force recommendations from June of 2015. Um, are we looking to adopt? all of the recommendations from this task force report as this transition happens? I'm not familiar with all of the recommendations in that report, but we would be happy to take a look and have a deeper conversation about it. Okay. Okay. Um, I would appreciate a follow-up to that. Okay. I'll turn it back over. All right. All right. Thank, you. thank you very much, my colleague. And I, I also just the concept paper sh doesn't sound that difficult. What a what a concept! Uh, so, um, we the, the the DOE has a thirty billion dollar budget. They certainly are have capacity to produce a concept paper. Um, if, if there's no no other questions, then I thank the panel for their time. Thank you. So we have a, a, a lot of a lot of speakers, um, numerous panels. So I think we're going to keep testimony to two minutes, if that's okay. I apologize in advance, um, but I think with two minutes, we're looking at all being here for another hour at least. So I'm going to try to keep it at two minutes. All right. Uh, we'll call up uh, Rosemary Sinclair, uh, Lois uh, Lee. Uh, Kim Medina, uh, Lisa uh, Caswell, and uh, Ines, Ines uh, Chobos.
I guess we'll work our way down. You could begin. Okay. We'll make sure that the sergeant uh, has the clock started, and you may begin. Hello. Um, good, good afternoon. Oh, it's not on. I'm sorry. Good afternoon, Chairman Traeger and Levin. Just want to thank you and everyone else that's here for the opportunity to speak to you on behalf of our early childhood daycare um, directors and assistant directors. My name is Rosemary Sinclair and I am the first vice president of CSA, the Council of School Supervisors and Administrators. We represent over 16,000 members, active and retired leaders for um, public school and our daycare centers. As you know, that highly effective early childhood education has a positive impact on students, communities, and neighborhoods. And I totally agree with, um, as you discussed about 1707, the teachers, pay parity, but I'm here today to talk about the directors and assistant directors of Early Learn. And we see that well-trained leaders as well as, as teachers are very important for the process of having highly effective early education. And we know that in order to attract and retain the best educators, we need adequate, adequate and fair pay. However, fairness remains a challenge in New York City, specifically salary disparities among early learn directors and assistant directors compared to our DOE counterparts. This jeopardized effectiveness of early childhood across the board. And uh, we are grateful for Council Member Lori Combo raising the awareness around disparities and introducing resolu Resolution 358 which calls for New York City to eliminate this disparity. We also want you to know that it is unfortunate that majority of our early childhood directors and assistant directors are minority women. And these people actually commit themselves to make a better community, have great um, programs for children, and we know that it is needed for them to have pay parity. It is important for them to not feel minimized or feel that they don't have the right to have the right amount of monies to satisfy what is needed today as far as pay parity. We feel that the disparity that runs counter to the DOE's mantra of equal, equality, and excellence. We don't see that when it comes to our early learn directors and assistant directors. Clearly, CSA strongly support resolution number 358, and we look forward to helping bridge the salary gap and consulting in the transition of early learn New York City to DOE. We respectfully request that the City Council stand with us to demand equity for these leaders and educators who have been taken for granted for far too long. Thank you. And I just want to uh, just quickly apologize and make sure that I am clear that the parity issue must extend to directors and assistant directors as well. I, I yes. know we heard a lot about educators and we deeply, we're all educators, yes. but this issue definitely extends 
to directors, assistant directors as well, because leadership is absolutely critical yeah. uh, on this issue. So thank you very much. Thank you for thank your you. short. Hello, my name is Lois Lee. I represent CSA. I'm the vice president of early childhood, and I'm also part of Chinese American Planning Council. I really love that Steve Levin, who has been in this issue for many years, we were part of the $60 million that you have to bail us out because we had the culturally competent people embedded in the community, and yet we were not awarded the contracts for four of our CPC sites. That was a travesty. Then I love that Mark Traeger, you're really on top of the education issue. So for the two of you to really collaborate, have this joint meeting was like uh, unbelievable. So now I'm just, <laughs> I'm going to tell you that you know of our overworked, um, you, know, you can ask me questions about how we have to do observation, evaluation, work with special needs, enrollment budget, CACFP, DOB, DOH, DOE, ECHRS, class, ESIR, and parent engagement. That's many of our other responsibilities that we do daily in taking care of kids. I want to put a, a personal touch in here. The DOE, I have worked many years, 47 years to be exact, and so the, um, I can see the DOE curriculum that we do for pre-K right now cannot be a model that is for 3K. We cannot do a stepping up or graduation ceremony. It is in big print, no stepping up or graduation. So at three o'clock in our aftercare and our wraparound, guess what we did? Stepping up and, and graduation, why? Because we told the parents this is the first of many celebrations and this is reason to celebrate. You graduated and you're going to kindergarten and they are well prepared. Now, DOE says you may also not teach the alphabets. So now the kindergarten teachers are saying they are not coming in knowing the alphabets. Guess what we do in the wraparound after care, after the pre-K hours are over? We teach the alphabet and how to write your names. They are well prepared to go to kindergarten. And then with the cultural competence, I have to say something about the, the Chinese and the Western, the Eastern and the Western style of teaching. Guess what? Chinese kids, they don't have a gene for math. They learn times tables when they're in, sec uh, in kindergarten. So we want to blend the both of the two best cultures in our education system. So I want you to see the whole view of what CBOs do that is very, very different from the DOE and really have us on the table so that we can tell you about how best to do these programs. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, my name is G.L. Tyler. I'm speaking on behalf of Kim Medina, our executive director, who was called away because of the Janice decision that, that mm. came down today. But uh, you have my written testimony. And one of the things I, I'm just gonna emphasize real quick is that there is not a two-tier system, but a multiple system. Head Start, UPK, uh, Early Learn, all on different structures far below what the UFT uh, get. And the expansion of UPK has been made on the backs of my members. When the planning and qualifications for the planning of early childhood education commenced, it was based on not parity, but super exploitation of these women who are predominantly women of color and heads of households. It has to be recognized, plus I had some other notes I want to say is that no mayoral administration since Lindsay uh, try, has tried to resolve parity. Uh, mm -hmm. CBOs that exist are retrofitted and are available to take children without spending millions of dollars on such needs with the uh, public school system. Plus, in the last 12 years prior to the uh, Bloomberg administration, uh, uh, the de Blasio administration, we set, spent 12 years fighting early learn with Bloomberg and, and other things. In the course of it, trying to save the system, we lost over 70 systems and 3,000 workers. This guy was a disaster to, to early childhood e education and when Early Learn was first implemented. He registered that more than 10,000 children would lose their standing. So basically what we're saying is that we want to see the will of this administration to enact parity. We haven't seen it yet. And thanks to the city council, I, you know, we're hoping that 
together with the advocates of the unions, uh, we can see some results during this period. Thank you. My name is Lisa Caswell. I'm the senior policy analyst for the Daycare Council of New York. And um, I just want to thank you sincerely for the depth of commitment that you exhibited. Um, we're all on the same side of the table over here, and it's really good to have you with us. Um, I just want to say that our job, um, w our work goes back 70 years, and we have 91 members serving 200 child care programs. And we are responsible for negotiating the labor contract on behalf of the city with these two, these two unions here. Um, we just want to thank you for, for your seriousness. Uh, we want to also strongly support the resolution that you've put forward. Uh, without salary parity, we'll continue to face the challenges of maintaining op optimal program operations while trying to hire and retain qualified teaching staff in the face of ongoing professional staff competition with the DOA. DOE, at this time in our system, entry-level early childhood education teachers who have their master's degrees and are state certified are paid $16,000 less than their entry-level counterparts. I brought the labor contract. Um, I brought the highlights. Um, they're available. A plus for preparation. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike you. the deputy chancellor yeah, we, and deputy we know what the B, we know Principal what the Barron would <laughs> Thank you. We know what the UFT salaries are right now. Um, and we also know there's an internal gap between certified, U, U, uh, certified uh, UPK teachers in the CBOs are making $3,080 less than their counterparts teaching younger kids. Um, what, we, what we really want you to think about is um, the fact that we're prepared to come up with that number that you've been asking for, and we're prepared to do it within the next 30 days. Um, these calculations will be based on the UFT's collective bargaining agreement salary scales with specific attention to cost of living adjustments and longevity increases. In calculating this funding, consideration must be given to the current employee benefit structure, I'm sorry about this, which includes salary, FICA, a pension, and health insurance. Our goal is to produce a figure that is as close to accurate as possible. We also want to have the city commit to salary levels for early childhood education sector that are comparable with the UFT going forward. Uh, we cannot successfully eradicate this problem without being prepared to maintain a commitment over time. So as they go up, we need to go up at the same level. Um, we have we brought these issues to your concern before. We have uh, serious concerns about the multi-year impact on program operations of not having certified teachers. They can, we can't open classrooms without certified teachers. And the average vacancy rate for those teachers, uh, we've done research that goes back three years, that is at least six months that we hold those vacancies without being able to fill them. Um, we also have some problems right now that we're working with the DOE to address. We understand that the UPK seats are supposed to be split 50-50. Um, they have been making a pretty serious effort to try to stop what was happening, which was a recruitment of children directly from our settings um, to fill UPK seats. Uh, and they have reversed that policy, and we expect that to be improved. But it has been very difficult to have uh, parents who chose nonprofit settings and then they oftentimes thought that they could get a kindergarten seat for their child the next year. So they've been working very hard on that, uh, but it was really problematic. Some teachers had to, some centers had to reseat their classrooms four times in September and October. Um, we also want to just talk to you about the fact that we're in, we're, we're in, we just finished some very good productive roundtable meetings with the DOE. Uh, we set them up, uh, they asked us to, and the full range of issues were discussed. Um, and there were already a bunch of meetings with Head Start that happened uh, that was very productive, but we expect to be asked back again. And there was not sufficient discussion on program models. Um, it, it was a very good start, but based on the length of expertise and the superior performance that you've seen in your research of the nonprofit sector, we expect that we would have ongoing input and not just the first time around. We've been assured that that will happen, but we, we want to have the system be held accountable for that. Um, and then finally, the facilities issues that you raised, I know you know about this because we've testified we've got NYCHA settings that are in deep need of repairs. We are wasting money uh, right now with, with fines being paid to DOHMH unnecessarily 
And uh, we've already gotten support from this administration on that issue. It's a very hot topic um, citywide. But we are in some serious trouble with our facilities. And, and related to that, we would like to have you consider that uh, every new affordable housing project for moderate and low-income families have a child care program in it. And you could do it with elderly, elder programs as well, do true multi-generational initiatives. Um, so we just want to say that we know that this city can do it. We know we've got the money, uh, but we have the willpower, and there's so much solidarity. And, and this is a tremendous opportunity. Um, but your leadership has been um, incredible, and we really appreciate it. Um, Thank you, Lisa and, and uh, GL and every, uh, our, our, our partners at, uh, at CSA for all presenting such an important unified front here. I mean, so I just, just wanted just to make clear, uh, because uh, Deputy Chancellor Wall kind of made reference to this, it wasn't the daycare council's uh, idea to not provide salary parity. The no. daycare council was provided a certain amount of funding to be able to negotiate a contract on behalf of the city. Well, the city's always sat at the table and they had control over the purse strings and our job has been to, to represent management and our concerns as management was very much in line with labor. Mm -hmm. There was never any question about the need to maintain stable operations and salary parity was the foundation of that. So we worked very hard to push it as far as we could and we're continuing in that process. And you made reference to this issue of I, I call it poaching of, of, of students from contracted care to DOE. Yeah. That, that was, I, my understanding was that, that was a, a happened aggressively by, by principals, is that, or, or by, and I'm sorry. To I think there were CSA, staff that were supposed to fill seats in okay. the DOE, and I think it went overboard. And I want to just be respectful to them, but yeah. it did not work for many of our members. Okay, because I heard yeah. that it was a ba major it challenging was a real process. Problem. Maybe it wasn't yeah. principles, but no, it was. That, it was that was just about to say. Okay, okay. What do you sorry. Mean principles. <laughs> was it, was it, it was, but, yeah. but it, there was. It was DOE staff responsible DOE staff. for recruitment, and okay. I d and I know they have addressed that, uh, and they took it very seriously, and we expect them to follow through. There's been changes to, with regards to protocol, so um, there's been a lot of challenges related to this, but it was really hard for us to lose kids where the parent chose us in the first place. Right, because yeah. there is a strong, I mean, in, yeah. in areas where, uh, you know, there's overcrowding in schools, parent seeing the opportunity to get into a kindergarten seat, right. uh, you know, may may opt to go into a pre-K seat in that school just right. to be able to have teachers right. in line. But they haven't, they've, they've, they've really tried to look at this, okay. it's just it didn't go well the first the time right around. Yeah. Moving in the right direction. Yeah. Um, okay. I so much appreciate all of the work that you all have done collaboratively um, and making sure that you know we are uh, well informed uh, and uh, and that we're you know uh, on the same page with you all I am strongly re recommending to everybody involved that that, that level of communication be maintained mm -hmm. uh, in a very um, you know in a very intense way yeah. over the coming months yeah. um, just to appreciate all the work that you all do. Yeah, and I just have one uh, quick, and thank you, uh, Chair. I just have one quick uh, question. You heard me ask the administration uh, this question. I'd love to hear your take on this because I, I used to be a union delegate and just want to hear from my union um, sisters and brothers. Um, is there anything that prohibits the administration right now from speaking? now with, with folks in good faith and saying let's resolve this parity issue once and for all. Is there anything in the law that prohibits them from saying we want to help solve this issue? I don't know of anything. There is nothing in the way <coughs> of doing it. We want to resolve this issue. And that's, that's my take as well uh, because I don't think the law is stopping us. I know that money is not stopping us. It's just a matter of doing the right. Thank you very you much. Did you say something about a pay parity for supervisors? Yes. We need to be at least, I'm, I'm going to throw out numbers, don't put this in bold, uh -oh. 7 to 10 percent above the highest paid teacher that we supervise. All right, so, all right, so that, so we're going to, we're going to leave those discussions at the collective bargaining yes, table. Yes, that's what I'm Because good faith bargaining yep. <laughs> involves good faith but bargaining. What you so, need to remember as right. well. Right. Again, the expansion of early childhood education. Absolutely. Since Lindsay. 
was based on the super exploitation of this labor. And again, prime predominantly women and women, women of color in communities of need. And we cannot forget that. I, I agree. And in the backdrop today of a devastating Supreme Court decision mm -hmm. that aims to, uh, directly aims to hurt working families and the power of labor to protect working families, I think this is the time now more than ever to come to the table, strengthen labor, strengthen yeah, families, and strengthen agree. our community. We totally agree. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Just can I say one more thing? Your, your idea on the concept paper, that's really important. <laughs> Okay. So you all support yeah, not just being involved in yeah, a conversation, concept paper. but having a yeah. concept yeah, paper. Ha people have to re formal. react to something, and yes. they have to hear from people in a formal context. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's on the record. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks again. Right. Next, we have uh, Faith uh, Bahum, uh, Lainey Hamesen. Uh, Stephanie uh, Gendel, uh, Shoa uh, uh, Limbu, uh, yeah, that's it. Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Gundell. I'm the Associate Executive Director for Policy and Advocacy at Citizens Committee for Children. Thank you for holding this hearing and for your unwavering commitment to early childhood education. Thousands of children are in early childhood education programs now because of the City Council. Um, we do also thank the Mayor for his commitment to early childhood education. Um, our testimony includes a lot of background, including the charts of the pay scales. Um, at, they were already in the record. Um, so I'm not Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I'm not going to read that. Instead, I'm going to focus on our recommendations um, because we're at a really critical juncture. Um, the transition, the maintaining the vouchers at ACS, salary parity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so to start with, we agree. There should be a concept paper. Um, we often submit comments to a concept paper. We should have a full discussion about those comments. Often those comments are then not adopted. Um, the um, recommendations of the Early Childhood Education Task Force that was started by Bill de Blasio, Mayor de Blasio, in response to advocate concerns um, should be looked at. The last recommendation in there is that there be a tracking system for keeping track of the recommendations and their implementation. That has not been done, as well as many of the other recommendations. Um, as we think about the needs of children and families, we look to ensure the availability of eight to 10 hours a day of care, as well as summer care during July and August. 3K and pre-K do not provide that, whereas Early Learn and other programs do, and that's critical for many families. We need to expand capacity to serve infants and toddlers. Um, we need to make all homeless children eligible for child care based on being homeless. That is not the case right now. Um, and we need to then do more to get those children into early childhood programs. We need to ensure the childhood, the early childhood system um, expands options, including non-traditional hours. I will hurry up. Um, we need to ensure salary parity, as you all talked about, and that needs to include um, all staff um, and all different levels of staff, including those serving children under three. Um, we need to, where possible, reduce the parent fee or eliminate it in early learn programs since there's no parent fee for 3K and pre-K. We need to maintain programs like Trauma, Stars, Trauma Smart that addresses the needs of the children. We need to work with the family child care providers to ensure they receive the training and the coaching that they need. 
Um, and as we've talked about, we need to make sure we hold on to those direct lease sites. I was a little concerned about some of that conversation, um, but we need to make sure we don't lose them during this transition, which sounds like multiple transitions with the School Construction Authority. Um, we hope the School Construction Authority can help with some of the facilities issues, perhaps in NYCHA. Um, as discussed, we need to seize upon opportunities such as the development of affordable housing to build more capacity. Um, and uh, we need to ensure that we don't replicate errors that were made in pre-K for 3K. Um, one of them has been um, segregating children by income in classrooms and programs because early learn children have an income requirement and pre-K and 3K children don't. So in some programs you have the lowest income children in a separate classroom, um, by a, which I don't think was anyone's intent, but that's been the result. Um, we need to ensure we don't lose any childcare capacity when we roll out a new RFP um, and that we're able to maintain the programs providing high quality care. Um, I know that seems obvious, but that did not happen the last time. Um, and we need to make sure that the new early learn rate, whatever it is, not only provides for parity, but enables classrooms to invest in materials and technology. And we should then index the early learn rate to inflation so that we don't have this ongoing issue. Um, and lastly, I just want to mention that we also need salary parity for the preschool education teachers. Um, my colleague from Advocates for Children is going to talk more about that. So thank you. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. My name is Shoshila Limbu, and I live in Woodside. I am the mother of Dean, a four-year-old child with autism. I am glad that the city is expanding public preschool programs, but the city must not forget about the children like mine who have disabilities. I first referred my child Dean for preschool special education evaluations more than one year ago at the suggestion of Dean's pediatrician. When the DOE sent me a list of evaluation sites, I made call after call, but the evaluation sites told me that because my family speaks Nepali at home, they could not evaluate my child. I reached out to the DOE several times to ask for help, but the DOE did not help. In fact, the DOE did not schedule evaluations for Dean until I got a lawyer from Advocates for Children involved, many months after I started the process. Even after evaluations began, the DOE delays continued. The DOE began evaluating Dean on January 25th but did not hold an IEP meeting until April 20th, three months later. At the IEP meeting in April, the DOE determined that my child needed a small preschool special education class, as well as a speech therapy, occupational therapy, and physical therapy. However, more than two months have passed and the DOE has not been able to find a seat in a preschool special education class for my son. The DOE does not have enough preschool seats for all the children with disabilities who need them. I feel lucky to live in a city that is building more 3K and pre-K classes, but my child needs a classroom too, and he has the right to be in a preschool special education class. I wonder what progress Dean would have made this year if, I, if he <laughs> had been in class with a special education teacher. Would he be starting to talk to me? Would he be able to play with other children? I'll never know because Dean had to sit at home all year with no special education instruction or services. My child deserves better. We must change the situation and make sure that every preschooler with a disability gets the evaluation services and classes they need. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me today. Thank you very much for that oh, testimony. Wow. <laughs> uh, good evening, Chairperson Traeger, Chairperson Levin. My name is Faith Bam, and I'm an advocacy and policy advisor at UGA Federation of New York. Uh, UGA is grateful to the council for including the need to correct salary disparity that exists across the early childhood education system in their response to the fiscal 2019 preliminary budget. And we are especially thankful to Councilmember Combo and Chairperson Traeger for introducing resolu Resolution 0358, 
Uh, we urge the City Council to pass this resolution and call on the administration to end this unequal payment system and invest in the pre-K workforce by establishing sal salary parity for teachers, staff, and directors between DOE schools and CDOs. So I hear a lot from our providers, our UGA nonprofit partners, about um, the issues they have in their pre-K programs. And a lot of that they deal with is they look at they're in a very interesting position because they look at DOE as both their boss and their competitor. Um, so in general, many of the CBOs I interact with feel their programs are expected to meet different standards than DOE programs. Um, so for instance, immunization, immunization audits of the records of CBO UPK programs are time consuming and costly to providers if violations are found. Um, recently, there was a requirement to place a child care performance summary report card at the entrance of CBO's UPK, UPK programs. It didn't take into account that the entrance to the program is different from one multi-service agency to another. It did, however, include information on how much CBOs would be fined if their card was missing, improperly placed, or deemed damaged, making clear the increased likeli likelihood of fines at multi-service agencies. Uh, many of my providers said, do DOE programs have these same repercussions? And uh, from what DOE said, it sounds like they do, but we still just don't feel like we're being treated the same way as some DOE providers are. Um, so this is just a small sampling of the issues CBOs have dealt with since the implementation of UPK. And honestly, the announcement of 3K for All has increased anxieties for our community-based organization, early childhood education providers across the city forcing many to wonder if the implementation of 3K will worsen the competition between CBO and DOE providers. Many may wonder why community-based organizations, particularly multi-service agencies, continue to host UPK programs or are even interested in becoming 3K providers. Um, simply, CBOs recognize the unique educational opportunity they provide young children and want to continue to offer this in their communities. But as we heard earlier, some changes must be made to the current UPK system in order for our CBO UPK programs to survive. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you all for your uh, really powerful and very informative testimony. Uh, just a quick question, I'll start with uh, you, uh, with regards to this uh, parent fee for early learning. Can you, sp is this for every parent regardless of income? Can you speak to this, please? Sure, because um, Early Learn, it's the child care portion of Early Learn that requires a parent fee from the federal government, and there's a sliding scale fee structure that's actually somewhat complicated. Um, and so for kids who go to, it started with pre-K and now we have for 3K, if they're in a Early Learn pre-K, their parent has to pay a fee. Um, the city has taken steps over time to reduce that fee in part because it's not the whole day anymore. Part, only part of the day is childcare. Um, they need to continue to reduce the fees to something more nominal. Um, these are the lowest income families in the city who are in the early learn programs. Um, and also do the same thing for 3K that they've done for pre-K in terms of reducing the fees. I, I appreciate this and I, I will circle back and get more information, I, I, I deeply appreciate that uh, uh, feedback. Um, a question um, with regards to uh, your, your child, um, how, old, how old is he? He's four. He's four. And um, what type of intervention service or what, what how did uh, this even start with regards to even a meeting? Obviously they failed to follow up and they, they, they failed you and your family, uh, but w how did this begin as far as even getting a meeting to discuss uh, this issue? Um, because my child, um, he's autistic, so they need to evaluate him in order for him to actually be placed in a school. Right. So um, with the evaluation sites that they gave me, they were like specific, they were specific, it had to be like Spanish and English or yeah, it had to be specific languages. So my family, we speak Nepali and English. So they didn't have a site that did Nepali and English. So yeah, we had to get a translator involved and everything. So yeah. And and how old? When was this? Uh, was he when this was all happening? Uh, my son was three. <laughs> three. And and you went. You contacted the the, the DOE. Yes. Right. District. 
forgot the additional one, but yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, were you able to identify a private, um, a, a, a private school that he could, uh, that would accommodate his language needs? A private school? Well, so under under the Carter cases, there uh, for, for special ed pre K, I think your child should be entitled to a reasonable accommodation uh, if they can't meet those accommodations w in a private school, and the city is required to to pay those. could talk offline yeah. yeah yeah I I just because uh, just 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 so you're aware um, one of the questions that I've asked folks here internally here at the council and I, and I will continue to is and I touched upon this with the administration if uh, particular issues are identified with children in early learn how is that accounted for in the transition to the DOE? Well, first of all, is early learn, do they have the capacity to provide the adequate intervention and support? Because the DOE, we're still holding them accountable to providing <coughs> adequate intervention and support for, for their students right now. And so I'm concerned because one of, you know, I, I agree as a former educator that the earlier we could identify any types of, uh, you know, whether it's a challenge, if the earlier we address it, the better outcomes down the road. But are we doing enough right now in early learn? And how are we going to account for those needs during this transition process, if you could speak to that? So some early learn sites provide integrated um, preschool special education services where children are integrated. So some children have special needs and some children don't. Um, but early learn in and of itself isn't for preschool special education. The Department of Education provides or pays for, and Randy has better words, um, for the preschool special education program separate and apart from Early Learn. And the other thing about Early Learn is there's an income restriction on it. So anyone above the 200% of poverty is not getting into Early Learn, even though there are plenty of three and four-year-olds who need preschool special education who wouldn't be eligible for Early Learn. But DOE is required to provide them, in theory, required to provide them the preschool special education and part of the issue is that there is not enough capacity um, in the DOE system for preschool special education slots and part of that issue is actually related to the salary disparities that exist for preschool special education teachers. So you see how this has a, r a ripple effect, a cascading effect across so many different areas a and again what, what's so heartbreaking is that we know there's money and a quick question for, for UGA, uh, is that right? Uh, so do you have any data to share about when there are difficulties filling a position and how long can it go? Because obviously that's an issue of, uh, we heard in, it, it could be months for, for some folks. Any particular data you could share with us? You mean filling the position for the children or filling the staff Staffing. positions? Yeah. Um, because we've had kind of actually both for one of our providers um, that there was actually uh, the increase of numbers of kids through the UPK program. Um, one of our providers actually was saying that um, they didn't really know where the numbers for their district were coming from because they're like, we don't know where these kids are coming from. Um, but the other part of it, I would have to get back to you as far as that. Sure. So I get enough on that. <laughs> but again, thank you all for your very powerful testimony here today. Thank you so much. Next panel, uh, Betty Baez uh, Mello, um, Maria uh, Capillo, uh, Gregory uh, Brender, uh, Christopher Triber. You may begin. 
Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the implementation of Pre-K for All, the expansion of 3K, and the transition of Early Learn to the Department of Education. My name is Betty Baez Mello. I'm an attorney and the, and the project director of the Early Childhood Education Project at Advocates for Children. As the city expands early childhood education, it must ensure that these programs serve all children, including children who are homeless, dual language learners, and students with disabilities. In my written testimony, I address all three of these populations, but today, given the limited time, I wanna focus on students with disabilities. The city's expansion of early childhood education allows it to identify children with disabilities at a younger age and to intervene early when services have the greatest impact. Already, more than 31,000 preschoolers in New York City have individualized education programs, or IEPs, mandating special education services. The majority of these children can attend the same 3K, Pre-K, and Early Learn programs as their typically developing peers. However, in order for these programs to properly serve these children, the city must build the capacity to promptly evaluate the students, hold timely IEP meetings, secure and secure service providers who can work with the students in these classrooms. Despite legally mandated timelines, we have heard from families who have had to wait months for an evaluation appointment, an IEP meeting, or for the start of services, causing children to miss out on much needed intervention. Now when a preschool student with significant disabilities cannot properly be served in a 3K, Pre-K, or Early Learn program, the DOE has a legal obligation to provide them with a preschool special education class. However, we've heard from families, and you've now heard from a, fam a parent whose children have IEPs mandating preschool special education classes, but they've remained home for months throughout this year because the DOE, the DOE did not have enough seats in special education, spe in preschool special classes. Many of these children are diagnosed with autism, are nonverbal, and have delays in multiple areas of development. <laughs> these children stand to benefit significantly from early childhood services, and the city cannot leave these children behind. The city must ensure that preschool students, that a preschool special class seat for every child for the upcoming year. Um, finally, we support Resolution 358 to provide salary parity, um, but we ask that the city also ensure salary parity for teachers of DOE contracted preschool special education programs. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Before we uh, move over to the next speaker, I just want to ask, so if, if, uh, DOE is not able to meet the special education or language needs of the child um, uh, requiring pre-K special ed. Um, uh, the Department of Education is legally mandated to, to uh, pay for a, a private setting to do that, correct? Well, so, at, and there are, are different needs, right? So the Department of Education definitely has a responsibility for ensuring the evaluations of the child, having, ho holding the IEP meeting and recommending the services. If a child's IEP recommends a preschool special class seat, the Department of Education is obligated to open that seat. Um, with regards to private options and the DOE paying for tuition for those programs, unfortunately there's a very limited amount of private preschool special, or of, of schools that have private preschool programs that do special education. Um, and we don't wanna create um, a lot of litigation in the area. We don't want that to be the default. We're hoping right. that instead that the Department of Education will open more preschool special classes. With the yes, right. okay. the we DOE can, we is can obligated to provide a special class seat. Yes, the there is litigation. The state possible. has a legal obligation to make sure that each child has an appropriate setting for their education. Yes. Uh, good, good afternoon. Um, so my name is Chris Treber. I'm the Associate Executive Director for the Interagency Council for Development Disability Agencies. Um, and basically we represent about 45 nonprofit preschool special ed providers. Um, and so, you know, I guess like two minutes, you have my testimony. It's pretty comprehensive. It has a lot of data in it. Um, just really three real points. One is all preschool special ed providers are certified, um, same quality, same requirements and qualifications as, as New York City DOE, they get paid between twenty-five dollars and $30,000 less. We have turnover rates in our schools that are above 25, 23 and 25 percent for our teachers right now. These are teachers who work with kids with autism. New York City is aggressively recruiting our teachers. They're taking them all the time. Any teacher that has experience working with kids with autism or others are gone within a year or so. We have brand new, inexperienced, new teachers in our schools 
and all the administrators who are supposed to be mentoring them are teaching classrooms. The other thing that's really alarming, and you can see it in our testimony, we recently did a survey. We have vacancy rates that have literally doubled in regard to our certified teachers and teacher assistants in our schools in a year and a half. The, the vacancy rates, and you can see it's in here, um, are up to 28% for certified teachers. That means that 28% of the current special ed teachers who are needed in the classrooms are vacant. They're being taught by administrators, subs, or others. These are kids who have the highest level needs. The, the agency that I, we represent are mission-driven agencies that serve kids with cerebral palsy, autism, and very high levels of need. These classrooms are not being served, these children are not being served by certified teachers. And really, the city is failing to basically provide an appropriate education to those kids. Um, you know, you could see a lot of the other information that I have in here. The other thing that I just want to mention really briefly is the city council uh, in 2015 passed a law on special ed reporting that required the New York City DOE to have to report this specific data regarding school age kids. It excluded preschool special ed kids from this data. We tried to FOIL the data from the city to get it, to find out how many kids don't have service right now and they haven't given it to us. We know from Advocates for Children and others that there are many parents, and you heard one, that are children are sitting at home right now because they don't have seats. Um, and really, part of the issue really is this pay parity issue that has to be addressed. Otherwise, these preschool programs won't survive. If CBOs are given this parity and our, our teachers aren't, we'll have no teachers left in our schools. Sorry, can I ask why has that doubled in, in the last uh, uh, year and a half? We think that part of it is, um, is that the DOE has been aggressively recruiting our teachers. Um, we think that part of it is that our teachers are getting paid $30,000 less for 12 months versus 10 months. And I'll just be really honest with you, we had a big rally on Monday. We had 400 teachers and parents at a rally. Um, and what we heard from most of the teachers who testified and you know, spoke up was they didn't want to leave, but if they got called by the DOE tomorrow, they would for, for $30,000 in a benefits package that's triple what we can offer. Um, and you know, there really is right now no light at the end of this tunnel. We're very concerned that you know, there are many, many children. New York City, just so you know, put out a needs request for 700 preschool special ed seats to be filled by July 1st. Our programs can't meet that need. We don't have certified teachers. That number is going to continue to grow. And you're going to hear more and more stories like the parent here who have children with significant needs, and there's no seats for them. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Traeger and Chair Levin, uh, not just for holding this hearing on this great topic, for, but for both being such fierce advocates on all these issues, um, especially around uh, years of fighting on salary parity. Um, I have some written testimony with our recommendations, which are really based on the idea of making a truly unified system successful and what does it take to do it all. I'll go through them briefly, and obviously the first one is, is salary parity. Um, our member agencies, which are New York City settlement houses, are on the front lines of really fighting for a fairer city, and it's just heartbreaking to the people working there that it's the actual staff who are, in some cases, bearing the brunt of this unfairness. Um, so we really thank you for this resolution and all the, I, I don't know how many rallies you've both been to <laughs> and, and the million things you've done. Uh, some of our other recommendations are kind of in a few different categories. One is to uh, keep with some of the progress that actually ACS has made. Uh, there have been some real good improvements that they have made since um, Early Learn came out in 2012, which includes um, moving towards a line item budgeting system, eliminating a provider match requirement, which was always ridiculous, uh, pre-licensing visits, uh, that actually help clear some of the regulatory hur hurdles with DOHMH and other city agencies. And also um, what uh, Deputy <coughs> Commissioner Vargas mentioned, the implementation of trauma-informed care, which actually gives uh, every staff member, not just teachers and assistant teachers, but even cooks and janitors, uh, the ability to recognize and be first responders to childhood trauma. Um, the other sort of part of unity is increasing access to things that DOE has uh, that CBOs don't have access to. So we think it would be very important for CBOs to have access to uh, capital funds to the School Construction Authority, particularly in NYCHA developments, which are such a huge portion of the CBO system operating in public housing developments that because of NYCHA's funding crisis are not able to support many of their own apartments, much less uh, keep programs that meet the very stringent health department requirements for child care centers, um, loan forgiveness programs, and also just more access to city databases um, to ensure the enrollment of children. 
Uh, lastly, I know I heard the bell, so I'll, um, but we also want to work um, to improve enrollment, and this includes making the fees that early learning parents pay nominal, which uh, can be done under federal law. Um, and we want to work with the state as well as with the city to see the elimination of beds dates that require um, community-based programs to fill their enrollment by a certain date so that if you do lose children in the middle of the year, you can continue to um, enroll later. Uh, the last thing, since you both asked about um, whether there were legal hurdles to um, uh, raising salaries on the basis of collective bargaining, um, I know there's already an answer that there's not. Um, I also wanted to add, it wouldn't actually be unprecedented. On April 14th, 2014, there was an increase in salaries that was actually announced in a press release by the de Blasio administration covered in the Daily News uh, for four-year-old teachers, which included those teachers in um, early learn settings whose programs had pre-K, and it was done years before a collective bargaining uh, agreement was negotiated. Thank you. Thank you, as always, for your thoughtful testimony, Gregory. Uh, thank and you. Thank you for this very uh, helpful report that you produced back oh. in 2016. Thank you. Yeah, we thought there was going to be a concept paper then. <laughs> 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 and we're so happy to hear you push for a concept paper now. <laughs> much appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Next panel, Deborah Lewis, uh, Harriet Larry. Miss uh, Deborah Blow, um, Carolyn Cohen, All right, you may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Carlin Cowan. I'm the Chief Policy and Public Affairs Officer of the Chinese American Planning Council. Thank you so much to Chair Traeger for the opportunity to testify today and for Chair Levin um, for your leadership on these issues. I am here to support the words of my colleagues and the other advocates, and particularly Lois Lee, who testified already. So I ha just have a couple quick items to share so we can move along our way. Um, I would urge you to read our full testimony, which has several points. The um, points in this testimony come down to the idea of fully funding the work that needs to be done through our contracts, especially as we move from ACS to DOE. A couple of highlights that I want to share. Um, currently, the budget only pays for seven and a half hours out of a 10-hour day, which is particularly difficult when it comes to supervision. We're urging the City Council to push for early childhood contracts to be fully funded for their actual hours in the transition. Um, currently, UPK and 3K provide six hours and 20 minutes of service, while Early Learn provides 10 hours of service. Currently, UPK and 3K operate from September to June, whereas Early Learn offers year-round. We urge for these to be fully funded and changed in the transition. And then lastly, we recommend that the uh, 2000 and, or the September 2020 RFP offer f options for funding for full day and extended day programming in order to meet the needs. And then of course, amplifying the very important issue of salary parity for our early childhood educators. It's important that we be clear when we're saying this, that the city is paying our early childhood educators a lower wage than their DOE teachers in CBOs, and this is a matter of utmost importance to us CBOs. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Good afternoon to the council committee. My name is Deborah Blow. I am an assistant teacher at Parkside Head Start. Mark Trevor is my councilman of my district. And I would just like to share with you, last week we rallied, and this was my poster. We work hard to teach our children to read, solve math, 
and science experiments. I have been a teacher in the classroom for 18 years. And my salary is a joke. I am struggling as a parent with a child that's in a college away in Georgia. My daughter attends Clark Atlanta University in um, Georgia. And myself had to stop going to school. And I'm three classes away from completing my, degree, my bachelor's degree to put my daughter through school because I had to make the sacrifice to send her to, finish, to go to school and for me to take time off. Um, it's a struggle, but it's a struggle that I know that is well, will be well-deserved at the end. I teach because I love the children I teach. Teaching is a passion that's in my heart. I can't even believe that I'm doing this because when I came out of high school, I went to work on Wall Street, and the salary that I made on Wall Street compared to what I'm making now, my friends laugh at me, that those who retired from Wall Street. And they say, Debbie, I can't believe you took that job to do. And I say, it's not the fact of what the, the salary. Yes, I would like parity very much so but I also enjoy what I'm doing and I know my time up I don't have a script to give you because I'm talking from my heart and I'm talking from what we do in the classroom the teachers in DOE couldn't even do half the stuff we do when those kids come there to them they're well nourished they're well prepared because of the work we do, and we work some long hours, okay? And that's all I have to say. What, thank you. What, what are those hours? My hours, our hours can go from 8.30 to 5.30 or 6. Every day? Every day. Both months a year? Yes, sir. <laughs> thank you. And We're thank like you the postman, <laughs> you know? <laughs> thank you for the amazing work. Yeah. Yeah, but you actually deliver. Yes. yes, we do. Yes, we do. Hi, yeah. my name is Harriet Larry. I'm also assistant teacher at Park Star Catholic Charity and also a shop, shop steward. I have been working in daycare since 1994. And the salary that I'm getting now is a joke. <laughs> because from 1994 to 2018, I shouldn't have to be saying, okay, I pay this bill this week and pay this bill the next week and take care of my grandchildren. One bill, I pay my light bill, or either take my grandchildren out, one or the other. It's a joke. When I'm taking care of other people's children, cough, sneezing all over me, change and pull them daily, 12 2 yells daily, go to work sick, can't afford to be sick. But we go every day, take the pressure from parents, take the pressure from outsiders, but we do it every day. It's not because of the pay, it's because our heart. Because some children, what we give them, some parents can't give them. They will come hug us before they hug their parents. And some parents will say, Ms. Larry, thank you very much. Right. You know, so hopefully the city will appreciate us. Yes. And I have a letter from a parent, which is, you know, it's a long letter. I'm not going to read it, but I pass it on to you. It's the same as the parent that was here was talking about her child have autism. And this lady, she fought and she fought to get services for her son. So I passed it on to the other parent. I gave her her information so when she can speak to her and get help for her child. But this lady and this lady, I'm going to give it to you. You can read it yourself. She fought hard for her children. We have her youngest son in our classroom now. But her four-year-old, Logan, like we said, he was diagnosed being aut having autism also. But, but thank God that he's able to. Oh, thank you. Thank God he's able to function now in the classroom. So thank you for listening to us. Thank you very much. And we greatly and deeply appreciate the work that you do every day. And we know it comes from your heart. And it's going to be up to us and this administration to give you that respect, not just in words, but through actions and through that paycheck. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Diana, uh, I think Nor Noriega, uh, Susan uh, Ochorn, uh, Eric Jors, 
uh, Christine Wicks and Lisa Paul. Since there's uh, only two up, well, I guess we'll just call up the, the final panel just so we can get uh, this all in. Um, we have uh, Patal uh, Pro Profeti, Profet, uh, Beverly Campbell, uh, Michelle Page, and uh, Anna Success. And if anybody wants to testify and we didn't call your name, you can speak to the Sergeant at Arms right now, and you can also come up on this panel. So otherwise, this will be the final panel. Oh, was your name called? Oh, up, up on the panel. Yep. But you, in order to testify, you have to have, yeah. okay, you did, okay, got it, okay. Whoever wants to begin? Whatever order. Good afternoon. My name is Diana Noriega. I'm the Chief Program Officer at the Committee for Hispanic Children and Families. And thank you for convening today, particularly to talk about the early care transition. We know that we don't have a lot of time, so we're going to kind of jump straight into um, our conversation. And we've given you a longer written testimony. So a report from the Center for Law and Social Policy did a close look at the number of children receiving child care subsidies in New York State and found that in 2016, um, only 122,233 children were served, and that was only 20% of those that were eligible to receive subsidy. This means that an estimated 80% of children are denied subsidies and support. If we look at the OCFS facts and figures for 2017, we find that roughly 20% of New York children that receive subsidies, of them, 64% are attending a program that is not center-based. And that's the conversation I've not heard today. What are we doing around family child care providers that are not in the centers? So 64% of children are relying on legally exempt or license-based home-based child care providers for high-quality education. That is a significantly high number that's not covered in the conversation when we're talking about pay parity. So in the context of professional investment and development, considering the impacts of the 3K expansions and what that center-based programs are being prioritized in this conversation, we are not talking about low-income, working-class women of color that are having these programs in their homes and the impact that this will have on their sustainability. So what we know for certain is that the majority of the workforce is women and over 50% of them are women of color. So 25% are Hispanic, 23% are black, and 60% are Asian. So while 64% speak English, 23% speak Spanish, 2% speak Chinese of the children that are being served. So 40% are immigrants, and 46% of all immigrant early childhood educators are classified as limited English proficiency. The average income of an early childhood educator who's a family-based provider is $27,000 a year. Let me underscore that these women are doing this work and living in poverty while doing this work. So when we talk about pay parity, we have to and cannot forget about the impact of family child care providers who are not eligible to receive the DOE contracts because they're not in centers, but we know that they're also represented by unions and they're being left out of this conversation. And they, are, they also work 10, 12 hours a day in their homes overseeing these children and they staff employees. So you're talking about women, this is their livelihood, their sustainability. So what we know in New York City in particular is that 93% of the providers serving at least one child would assault, and this is, we've talked about New York State, New York City, it's 93% are in home-based centers, home-based care. 
That's 93%. So the conversation that's being had today around pay parity is only focused on a small percentage of those being served in New York City. So I have a longer testimony again that you can review. We're more than happy also to meet with council staff if they have any questions. I just want to say I very much appreciate that testimony. It was on my list of questions that I didn't get to around for family child care providers, but it's, it's certainly an important part of the system, and we want to make sure that it is addressed as this uh, entire process is going. So I really appreciate you bringing that up uh, with your testimony. We, we won't, we won't uh, leave it to the side. We're going to address it. Yes, and I just have a quick question. So they, and I also thank you very much for that powerful testimony. Uh, so it's my understanding that the voucher, the, the vouchers uh, cases are, are remaining under ACS. Is that, is that, that that's correct? Um, now, you mentioned, and I appreciate that, that these are, these are not center-based, but you're saying that they are still represented by unions. They are. Can you speak to me, uh, can you explain to me why are, th why is this not a part of the greater parity conversation from, from your point of view? I mean, we, we are not a union, so we can't say per se why it's not a part of the greater conversation. Um, but we do provide services to about 1,500 family child care providers per year. And so oftentimes when we're meeting with them, they're expressing their concerns about the fact that they don't feel like they're being seen or heard in these conversations, not only around pay parity, but even the streamlining of the systems and the transition from ACS to DOE. So we know this is going to have a significant impact. And what's so important about this is no one thinks about the unintended consequences and how women of color are always the last to be considered and are always failed by our systems. As we professionalize these sectors, it is so important to lift up our immigrant, of, immigrant women and women of color in this process. And just to be clear, the union that's representing uh, family child care workers is the United Federation of Teachers, correct? That is one union, yes. That's one. What others? There's one other. We, we, yeah, I can't remember. I, that one I'm. CSA of State? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's clearly we have, when I say we, us here, we, we have some work to do to make sure that every single person um, and their, I mean, this is, this is, not just parity here, this is just b basic equity, f fairness, justice, s more ways than one. I think the way you've, s you've laid it out is, is profound and very powerful, and this must be a part of this conversation, no question about it, and thank you so much for your powerful testimony. Mm -hmm. Hi, good evening, thank you for having me. Um, as I was preparing for tonight, I decided to um, speak for my staff on behalf of them. I'm also happy to um, say that I've worked with many people in this room on the statistics and you know been in the field so thank you for having me. My name is Dr. Michelle Page and I represent University Settlement Society of New York. As an administrator for community-based organizations throughout New York City for the past 18 years I've had a front row seat to the various transitions early childhood has faced. These changes that New York City has already endured and will soon face are cause for great concern. Equal pay for equal work and salary parity are not just catchphrases or clever sound bites. They bring to light the disparities our staff face in CBOs, early childhood programs in particular, preschool teachers and community-based organization represented by a large contingent of women of color, have longer work days, longer program years, all while fulfilling the requirements of multiple funders that often have conflicting expectations. This is not a tale of two cities, as our mayor says. It's a tale of a fractured city. This system has created a great divide in which professionals have no choice but to leave their families and communities they love in order to pursue a livable wage to sustain their own families. The mass exodus that this has created ultimately leaves agencies no choice but to close classrooms and in some cases entire programs. Children and families are the ultimate sacrifice to this wage and workforce issue. If you could imagine building a structure, a house, and upon inspection, the contractor noticed a crack in the foundation. The right thing to do, the ethical thing to do, 
is to halt all work and fix the crack. Building upon a faulty foundation, whether metaphorically or literally, will guarantee instability with the entire structure. DOE cannot continue to ignore the faulty foundation. The DOE should not move forward with the expansion of 3K for all until the foundation of the system is fixed, enabling the early years of education to flourish and create successful lifelong learners. Turn our advocacy into action do the right thing and create compensation that is equitable and respectful. Thank you. Hi, my name is that was me. Yes, hello. Um, my name is Susan Oxhorn. I'm the founder and principal of ECE Policy Works. And I just want to thank you. I wish you fellows had been around when I've been looking at these issues for a couple of decades, um, starting um, with my tenure at the New York City Professional Development, Early Childhood Professional Development Institute. I'm a writer and I'm a policy analyst and really now an activist and advocate for the whole child and really putting the whole child at the center of education reform. Um, in my book, Squandering America's Future, I chronicled the history of de Blasio's um, implementation of universal pre-K. I want to say right up front that I was a main booster of it. I publicly said so. Um, I was thrilled to, to see universal pre-K finally coming to, pa to pass. There was a great appetite for it. And ironically, a lot of people don't know that it was a Republican governor, George Pataki, who enacted it into legislation. Um, I also saw de Blasio's pre-K uh, for all as a lever for change in a time of political sclerosis. Um, and it was really confirming early childhood as a public good. So I have very little time and everyone has talked really eloquently and in great detail about wage parity. That has been very close to my heart. Um, so I'll leave that out. It's in my testimony. Um, but I will talk about two issues that have become a, a, a growing concern to me as we look at the transition from Early Learn to the Department of Education. And we bring our three-year-old children are not our youngest, but very young and tender into this, this education system. Um, and early, early childhood's merge with the, with the public school system has been a kind of a Faustian pact because in return for uh, legitimacy and investment, what has happened is the earliest years have not been protected from standards-based accountability, notably the Common Core. So what we're seeing and we are seeing these in kindergarten, we're seeing this in kindergarten in New York City. I mean, we're seeing this all across the country. In New York City and increasingly in preschool, children are being assessed, including on laptops. They are not being allowed to, um, to explore and to, you know, to really have creative, rich experiences that children of more affluent parents uh, have access to. Um, and most disturbing, and this is very close to my heart, is the absence of play. Play has disappeared, and play is the primary engine of human development. Uh, so this is a real problem. And for our most vulnerable children, immigrants, those with disabilities, children of color, um, and also living in poverty, uh, of whom, of course, New York City has many, this trend is adding toxic stress and a sense of failure to our most vulnerable children. And the second, which I call the Achilles heel of this whole, of de Blasio's initiative, and in fact, the city's education system, and I'm not alone in this, um, is segregation. And it's not starting in the upper grades. It is starting very, I mean, one could argue it starts prenatally um, or with birth, but uh, it is starting in, you know, at the age of three and four. And really, um, I mean, you know about UCLA's Civil Rights Project, you know, in 2014, and they deliver the news that New York City, the largest school district in the country, is the most segregated. 
So we also had the Century Foundation in 2016, which published an analysis of data from 2014 to 15 that year, which showed New York City's pre-kindergarten classrooms to be among the city's most racially divided. So we have major challenges here, and I am delighted that all of these issues came up in your deliberations, and I am thrilled that we have you know, the two of you leading this committee on the city council because I've been, uh, I was a career changer. I'm a former journalist and I, so I came in in the late 90s. But all of this has been going on for decades, as your colleague said, longer than I've been even in the field. And so in order to ensure equity, social justice, and the kind of outcomes that de Blasio and his and all of his deputies are, you know, seeking. I mean, this tale of two cities, right? That's the trope. Well, we're not going to get them unless we level the playing field. And I see that as both figurative and, and, and literal. And so I, it is my hope that you will continue to, to really, you know, keep your nose to the grindstone of these issues. And I thank you for this opportunity. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, this is my first city council hearing. <laughs> I just found out about it like yesterday, and uh, I really wanted to be here. Uh, my name is Anna Success. These are my kids. Um, this little one just finished pre-K the other day. Um, <laughs> and she also, Alessia, finished uh, at the same school where I teach. and. Um, just so happens I'm teaching at the same school that I attended as a four-year-old. Um, <laughs> so I've lived in Queens my entire life. I'm a New York City native. Um, next year I'll be starting my 18th year of teaching. I started you know, straight out of college like a lot of people. Um, I taught kindergarten for 11 years in both um, public charter and a little bit in a um, preschool for children with disabilities. Um, both in Queens and Manhattan. Um, I'm licensed, I'm certified, I have a master's degree, and because it's my first year teaching pre-K for all, I make $50,000 with no benefits. Um, yes, no benefits. And I have a family. Um, so yeah, it's my first year teaching uh, pre-K. Uh, but my 18th year will be this coming year. So after taxes and after paying out of pocket for health insurance, I won't tell you what I bring home, but it's, you know, for a teacher who's been uh, really, you know, I just became a teacher really because I was blessed with a really good education and really wanted to pass that on to my own students. Um, anyways, um, I wanted to say that in my humble opinion, I don't think that this uh, pre-K for all and 3K program should be expanded yet until, like Dr. Michelle said, really the cracks are fixed. I mean, we have teachers that aren't getting paid, that have absolutely no benefits, and yet we want to expand this program and offer this free education when the teachers are really struggling. Um, uh, just a couple more quick things. Um, additionally, the director of the school where I work is in her 80s. She was there when I was four years old. Um, she, as well, has no benefits and no pension because she's not part of the system. So when she leaves, she leaves with nothing. And she has dedicated her life to th teaching <laughs> three and four year olds. And you guys know who I'm talking about. She's just an ama really incredible, incredible director. <laughs> um, she's been at our school for 53 years. My, uh, the teacher in the classroom where I work, my co-teacher, has been teaching in the school for 32 years. She's a widow. She also has no benefits. Yes, but we're there because we love the school. We love our neighborhood. Um, <laughs> let me tell you, she doesn't know if she can ever retire because she's alone and she has no health insurance, absolutely nothing, just her paycheck, which is significantly lower than what the city is offering. Um, and last thing I wanted to say was, um, 
I don't know if this is a, a, a very bold or not bold thing to say, but um, I like the idea of pre-K for all and 3K for all. However, I feel that families that can pay something or, or full tuition should pay. And I wonder if families that can afford to pay something, um, if that could help maybe offer teachers benefits. We know there are plenty of families in the city that cannot pay, but we also know there are a lot of families that can pay. So for example, in the school where I teach, our threes pay a tuition, which is not, which is a lot of money. And then when they move into the pre-K, they pay zero. These families happen to be families that could afford to pay something for pre-K, but yet they're getting it for free, which is great for them. I mean, it's wonderful. But what if those families paid something into this pre-K? I'm just wondering if that could help alleviate some of this, you know, being able to offer teachers benefits and being able to expand this program. And that's just something that I've been thinking about. I'm sure people have different opinions on that. But I do think about it because they go from paying a full tuition for a three-year-old to paying zero. Thank you very much. Good job, Mama. <laughs> uh, really powerful stuff, and congratulations on, on, on uh, graduation, and that's it's awesome. Um, just to tell you that. Uh, it doesn't even have to get to that because there are billions of dollars in reserves here in New York City's budget. There is more than enough money to get this done right now. There is nothing that's stopping that yeah. within the law or money. If we don't have to, to get that's much better. Yeah. Just a suggestion. Yeah, there, there yeah. is more than enough money to get this done right now. And the former teacher delegate in me hearing your testimony it's very hard to hear this because when we hear about teachers choosing, choosing this profession, it's a calling. It's more than a job. It is a calling. You have to love kids. If you don't love kids and working with kids, you should not go into the teaching profession. And um, when I'm hearing teachers talk about not having benefits and just being so gr grossly underpaid, um, we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. Um, but we're not going to stop fighting until this gets done. And uh, you have Chair Levin, uh, who's done an outstanding job in his committee, and you have the full weight of the Education Committee uh, that has your back. Uh, thank you very much for your powerful testimony. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and I think this is the, the final panel. Uh, <laughs> Alex Ortega, Fran uh, DeJong, and uh, George uh, Pena Herrera. Hello. Um, hi, my name is Fran DeYoung, and I teach at the same school as Anna Success. Um, and I wasn't planning on speaking. This is my first council meeting. Um, and I also um, want to say that I'm glad that I know about this meeting, and I think a lot of teachers would have attended if they had known. Um, and if we could get the word out, um, I think that would be great. Um, I'm a parent of a kindergarten student. I have a master's degree in childhood education and early childhood education. For 13 years, I worked um, in elementary school um, in childhood education. And this is my first year as a preschool teacher um, because of the fact that my daughter went to this school and it's a great school um, and there was a retiree and there was an opening. So I took it because it was literally five minutes from my house. and. The wonderful school, the best school I've seen. Um, but 
two, as soon as I negotiated my salary, I went down $30,000 to work at this school. Um, and I think that's crazy. Um, you know, the difference between teaching kindergarten and teaching five-year-olds and then teaching three-year-olds, you lose an entire salary. I mean, it's such a ridiculous thing. Um, and I will say, as a person who has taught first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and now the threes, threes is a lot harder. <laughs> um, I can't even tell you. It's you know, kids sneezing on you, wiping up messes, bathroom issues that you never had to um, incur in third grade. You know, I, I dealt with third grade testing and it was a lot easier <laughs> than that. Um, and honestly, like, I do not see myself staying at this school because of the disparis you know, the disparity in pay. There is no union, you know, there's no pension, my sick days are different, the hours are different, um, if my kids have, you know, are sick, I literally re rely on my husband who works for the DOE to take a sick day because I cannot take a sick day. Um, and I think that's ridiculous. The last thing I want to say, um, well, two things. Um, one is I think this is a minority issue. Um, I am a woman of color and I think this is an issue that women of color and women in general are working these schools and we're not being taken seriously um, in pre-K in general um, and daycares. Um, and I think it's not an issue because men are not working at these schools um, and it would be such an issue of disparity of pay. And the last thing, um, as a parent of a kindergarten student and, and you know a person who knows a lot about education, um, I. I'm very concerned with the lack of play in the pre-K program. Um, the kindergarten and the DOE is set up for a lot of worksheets and test prep while private schools are being focused on play and just the curriculum is a world of different art, music, play versus test prep reading in kindergarten, learning vowels, you know, it's just so different. And I think that if people knew that, um, they'd be very concerned with that, um, you know, so. Hello, my name is Alex Ortega. I'm uh, on the board of directors of Beaumont Community Daycare in the Bronx. Uh, I wasn't gonna speak initially, uh, then I, in got a little troubled by the lack of information that was prepared by the deputy chancellor and the deputy commissioner, um, which kind of reinforced some speculation that I had initially. Uh, the speculation was that I was fearing that the, I guess the long-term goal of the Department of Education was to effectively make the, the CBOs as an overflow sort of situation. Uh, we've been kind of looking at this and thinking what possible reason is there to not either be willing to engage in renegotiation or to uh, kind of keep things as they are and turn a blind eye and not be willing to even acknowledge the fact that this is a real hurdle that we have to face and, and overcome. Um, and the only thing we can really think of is that they want to make the Department of Education or in the, I guess the public schools, the primary source of, I guess, preschool education, whereas the CBOs would then become a overflow where it's, it's not effectively a and again, this might be just cynical, cynical uh, speculation on my end, um, but I, I fear there, there isn't a desire for parity because there is no motivation for that desire of parity. Um, it's, it's their concentration of, of, of dollars that are being controlled by the D, uh, DOE, and then the overflow of these other organizations which happen to exist, which politically can't get rid of, uh, but at the end of the day, well, that's just kind of what's there. Um, and and that, that's a fearful to us because, again, our, our center and what we've demanded as being a, a board member is, is the best. And, and we're in a very, very poor uh, area, an economically disadvantaged area, um, but we've always pushed for everyone gives their all the entire of the way. And we're on the board of directors, none of us get paid, and, and at the end of the day, it's very hard for us to push that, uh, but we require it because we feel our children and our communities deserve that. Um, so just, just to the city council, I, I ask just to kind of keep that in mind and bear that in mind as things progress forward. 
<coughs> that um, that that's a, f a real fear that we're seeing that it might become that structure of overflow as opposed to everyone working together. Thank you. <coughs> uh, name is uh, George Panarera, uh, director at uh, East Cabo Day Care Center, a center in uh, Upper Manhattan. Uh, definitely was not ready, but after hearing some of what's gone on and, and having heard that this meeting was taking place, it's the first time I'm actually speaking like this, so uh, just have a little patience. I'll be short. I can only tell you that my experiences as a director has been over 30 years following the path of uh, the world of daycare. My wife, on the other hand, has followed the path of the DOE. And I can tell you she's been like a thorn on my side every year telling me, when are you gonna come over? When are you gonna come over? And, and, and I think what has kept me in the world of daycare is the, the philosophy. Very different. And it's becoming more evident now and watching all the changes that have gone on. And I thank you guys so much because uh, with what we went through with Early Learn previously with the last administration, I just hope that something like that doesn't repeat again with what I kind of see. It's just the DOE once again not being prepared and they're gonna rush it and it's gonna have uh, detrimental effects in a lot of programs. So for my situation, with childcare standalone programs, unlike Head Start, uh, we don't have those support mechanisms in place. It is crazy when I tell you that uh, teachers wear different hats to be in compliance. They become family workers. We become counselors. All the things that right now the DOE is providing and supporting, uh, for us it's been happening already because we've had to be in compliance with other agencies like the Department of Health or else we would not be in existence. So it's always been this upward struggle to be in compliance and now it seems like more is going to occur where the teachers again are going to be pressured. I'm not going to beat a dead horse about the parity because that's absolutely the main reason why we have this going on but at the same time what I fear the most is, just like with UPK, I believe that teachers in our programs, directors in our programs, are the experts in these ages of three and four. What is very new to the DOE, and we saw it coming with the fours, where they came out and they kind of learned from us, and they got all of what classrooms should look like and what it should be like and then somehow it went into effect into the public schools. Now the same thing is gonna occur with the threes. They're coming out and yes, we welcome them and we know it's just a matter of time before we fall into that system. But they have to kind of really, you guys need to pressure them into making them understand that the worlds are very different and, and we have many different setups in our world. We have Head Start, there's just so many different types of programs and when they just keep focusing on, uh, on the teachers and that, okay, very little do I hear about the roles of the directors and how they're gonna play a role in the vision of where the DOE is gonna go in two years. Uh, what's gonna happen? Uh, you know, many directors, we've gone through the path. Like I said, we reached the cap. We've been in the classroom from assistants to, to group teachers to directors. For many years, that's just the path that we followed and we're there. So now we are a little shaky as to hearing, okay, we are part of CSA, but we're not part of CSA when it's in discussion regarding UFT with principals and vice principals. Don't wanna be there, that's fine. But they need to recognize us in some way what our role is gonna be to work in the settings that we're in now, especially when three you know, the three-year-old uh, moves forward, the 3K for all moves forward. I believe we're the experts in that field, but I am not hearing us being uh, recognized in a way that they, uh, Mr. Wallach will say that they're out in the programs and they're kind of hearing and taking it all in, but I've seen him in many ACS meetings where he has not had answers. Uh, and that's not just today, but he hasn't had answers before because they don't really know where they're heading themselves, but we're just kind of being brought into it. So, you know, I think to, to keep it short, I do ask that you keep that pressure in the DOE. I think the concept paper is a must. They need to, we need to know what is exactly how this is gonna 
all play out in the end. Please also keep in mind that many directors, um, you know, we grow professionally too. Many directors took what is a certificate, uh, which is the CPAC, which is a credential, which is the children's program uh, for administration credential. It's a certificate that was two years of, uh, of work that directors went to uh, in, in, in a college, accredited college. We received certificates that we found out later on were only um, recognized by the state, not by the city. So we said, hmm, that's interesting. Went through two years of school, did all these credits in administration to further our professional growth, and now we find out that it's not recognized by um, the DOE or in the city. So what they do recognize is a CBL, School Building Leadership, SBL, I'm sorry, SBL, which again, is something that is from a different world, which many of us are not connected to because our experience is not in that public school setting. It's not, like I said, it's not part of our world. So I was just hoping that at least that is noted that there has been certificates that directors have uh, accomplished that have been more related to the world of early childhood in, you know, in the early childhood uh, scope. So I think I'll keep it short, just uh, keep asking those tough questions. Don't let them, you know, <laughs> don't let them off the hook. Don't let them just take over. <laughs> I thank you so much. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Yeah, I, I uh, before I ran for council, I completed my courses and I got the SBL, but it does not compare to your credentials and, and to your experience. And I think that's a very, very valid, fair point about who's asking for your expertise, uh, who is reaching out to you, because quite frankly, they're talking internally amongst themselves, but who's actually yeah. learning f uh, from you and asking all the right questions. So. Thank you for your outstanding uh, work and advocacy, and and um, we as we appreciate you know your wife's uh, <laughs> she's uh, lobbying you to to, to, to yeah. switch, stay here. I believe. With, with <laughs> and uh, let's continue this fight together for parity and fairness and justice once and for all. Thank you all very Thank much. You. Thank Absolutely. You so much. Sure. Yeah. And with that, we are adjourned.